uh, clerk's office ready? Yes. Great. It looks like we do have a quorum. We'll go ahead and call this meeting to order the Public Safety Finance and Strategic Support Committee um, on December 16th. We can get a roll call, please. Arenas? Arenas? Jones? Present. Mayhan? Here. Jimenez? Here. Perales? Here. Quorum. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first up, we have a review of the work plan. Um, any recommendations from staff? I, I see none. Uh, and then um, any recommendations from my colleagues for anything to be added, drop preferred. Not seeing any uh, hands up there. Um, and I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll let uh, Blair Beekman speak on this. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, happy last meeting of the year, I guess. Um, I just came from a very interesting VTA uh, uh, ANF so meeting. You can stick to the topic of review of our work plan. Totally, fully. That I, I, I'm, I'm introducing the subject. Uh, they talked about the future of a, or the current year of inflationary practices. It was much of the same as this item, basically. Where in this item, you know, you you discuss you you discuss your uh, in the agenda, you know, the different trends for this this quarter. Um, you know, it was very nicely stated that um, you know there was serious inflation issues, and that we worked on at the beginning of the year here in San Jose on the retirement plan issues. Uh, what what will be our inflationary practices for this next year and for the next few years? And the VTA very nicely brought out that we're in a bit of a difficult pinch at this time with inflation issues. I think we can navigate it, them. And I was just reminded that the lectures from San Jose here at the retirement boards at the beginning of the year can very much help with that navigation process right now. And I just wanted to thank yourselves for those early meetings uh, at the beginning of this year. Um, they were important and they, they had a very specific good direction that we did not have to go through this inflationary difficulties we're going through. But we had to have, uh, you know, the police union raises issues and other issues that needed to be addressed at that time. We could have put that stuff off a bit, I feel. And I think those are the reasons why we're dealing with these inflationary issues now. And I'm sorry to say it, uh, but it's just it is what it is. And we're, we're, we're learning the steps to work out of that now, I think. Um, just to mention that here at this time, just so we can be aware of what we're working towards and how we can help ourselves uh, in the next few years. And, and good luck to uh, the cooperative effort from all of us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we have no changes, so we'll go to the consent calendar. We have one item, if I can get a motion to accept. So moved. Second. Motion and a second for consent. Um, and uh, I see Paul Soto's hand up, so we can go over to uh, public speakers. This is on consent. There's the one item, which is the bi-monthly financial report. I'm sorry, my hand was for the, uh, for the next item. I ain't got anything to say on this. Okay, thanks, Paul. Can we get a roll call vote, please? Arenas? Yes. Jones? Aye. Mayhan? Aye. Jimenez? Aye. Perales? Yes. Okay, our motion passes. Thank you. Uh, that'll move us on to item D1. This is the downtown and high knee neighborhoods foot patrol status report. And I will turn it over to leave the chief or yeah. sure I'll, um, I'll start it off uh, thank you uh, chair um, I thank you uh, good afternoon everyone uh, thank you for uh, having us on and we're gonna have the captains uh, present um, their reports and their divisions but I want to start off by uh, just reminding everyone of the importance of um, foot patrols or walking beats uh, this has been something that uh, since the onset of uh, policing, where officers uh, get to know the, our neighborhoods, their community, 
through uh, dialogue. And, uh, and one way to do that is through uh, walking the beat. Um, obviously the uh, advent of technology and um, cities growing, uh, we um, got away from that, but uh, this is at the core essence of uh, policing uh, in that uh, that's where we build relationships uh, when the resources are available to have these, um, these walking beats. So uh, we understand the, the value um, of these type of resources in our most impacted communities. So uh, you'll hear today uh, from our captains and uh, the strategies that they're deploying and how they're using walking beats uh, in their own division. So um, with that, I'll uh, pass it on to the uh, first captain uh, who will be um, presenting um, their strategies in their division. And thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Chief Mata. Good afternoon. Welcome everyone to the downtown and high needs neighborhood foot patrol status report. Next slide, please. Good afternoon, chairperson, members of the committee and council members. My name is Carlos Sacasa. I'm the central division captain. The three divisional captains and I will be presenting on the foot patrol status report. I will cover the overall foot patrol program as well as both the downtown foot patrol and Central Division Foot Patrol Walking Beats. Captain Todd Trail will cover the Foothill Division. Captain Jason Dwyer will cover the Southern Division. Captain Brian Shad will cover the Western Division. And finally, we will have an opportunity for questions after each division. Next slide, please. Foot Patrol Program Overview. Next slide. The Foot Patrol Program consists of four components. The first one is positive non-enforcement contacts. This allows us the opportunity to provide positive contacts with our community, businesses, parks, schools, et cetera, within the four specific divisions. Community engagement and partnership. The chief touched on it. This is an opportunity that we focus on the importance of building positive relationships and partnerships, not just with community members, but with schools, with visitors, and all of our community members within those divisions. High visibility and deterrence. Again, providing enforcement within those specific divisions. And proactive enforcement, again, allowing the walking beat officers to have specific target goals when it comes to proactive enforcement. This model allows us to provide visibility, presence, focus on relationship building with those specific locations and high needs areas. Next slide, please. The foot patrol variables consist of different deployment days and times various locations, and those locations can vary from project hope areas, high needs areas, areas of recent increasing crime, areas that have been identified by council members that have been identified by other communities, other areas that have, we've seen an increase in calls for service. Number of participating officers is based on staffing within those specific divisions. The allotted budget that we have to, that we need to make sure that we stay on for the fiscal year and specific divisional needs and objectives. They, those have been outlined by each divisional captain within their own division. Next slide, please. The citywide foot patrol budget, currently all four divisions share a total of just over 770,000 for fiscal year 21-22. As you can see in the purple pie chart, 250,000 is allocated to 32% of that budget just for the downtown foot patrol, 60% excuse me, 60,000 and 8% to the Central Division Foot Patrol, 146,000, 19% to the Foothill Division Foot Patrol, again, 146,000, 19% to the Southern Division Foot Patrol, and just slightly over that, approximately 167,000, 22% to the Western Division Foot Patrol. It should be noted that a total of an extra 20,500 was an added budget at the D7 Council Member Esparza that was left over from fiscal year 21 to 21, which indicates a difference of over $20,000. Next slide, please. Downtown Foot Patrol and Central Division Foot Patrols. First, I wanna take a quick moment to explain the difference between the two foot patrols. The Downtown Foot Patrol covers the general downtown core locations and adjacent areas. 
The central division foot patrol covers other areas outside the downtown area, but within the central division, including areas like Alviso, Little Italy, William Street Park, the Guadalupe River Trail, and the Kesto Park, et cetera. Next slide, please. I'm not sure if I can see the slide down here. There you go, thank you. Funding and expansion drift. In 2014, the downtown foot patrol was implemented and the program started with just over $200,000. As you can see from the chart, the city and the department saw a value in the program and funding has continued to increase since the program started. The allocated funding had varied throughout the years and currently the downtown foot patrol and the central division have a combined 310,000 for fiscal year 2021-2022. So far, we have spent just over $100,000 currently on pace for the year. Next slide, please. The downtown foot patrol staffing model, as you can see, the staffing model has slightly changed. In the past, we had one sergeant and four officers. Monday through Friday, typically from 9 a.m., 9.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. Currently, we have one sergeant and two officers Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m., Wednesdays and Fridays between 3 p.m. and 8 p.m. This allows us to expand our overall visibility and presence throughout the walking beats. Next slide, please. The Central Division Foot Patrol staffing. In the past, we had one sergeant and two officers, two days a week, depending on availability, five hours a day typically from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Currently, we have one sergeant, two officers, on Tuesdays only between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. This is as a result of only being allocated $60,000 fiscal year 21-22. Next slide, please. Both the downtown and central division foot patrols have had a positive impact in the community and have been very successful. Throughout both programs, officers have made several arrests and citation, a total of 18 in Q1 from July to September of this year. Additionally, they have encountered a wide variety of situations that were not directly related to policing. As, a, as an example, collaborating with code enforcement, housing, and other nonprofit resources to establish positive outcomes in our community. In each of these cases, officers have worked to facilitate opportunity for outreach, education, and development of local businesses and neighborhoods. We will continue to proactively solicit feedback from community members to address concerns brought to our attention, as well as information received from each council member's input and recommendations moving forward. While the police department currently does not have sufficient ready positions available to make the foot patrol a routine assigned function in the downtown area, the downtown foot patrol and central B programs allow us the opportunity to continue to collaborate with businesses, community members, and partners, not just in the downtown area and the central division as well. I will continue to assess if additional locations need to be implemented in the walking beat structure based on crime analysis data and community concerns and other recommendations. Thank you. I will now pause for any questions that you may have for both the downtown foot patrol or the central division walking beat patrol. I think we'll we'll, uh, we'll take the, the full presentation and we can we can come back around. Okay, I will now turn it over to Captain Todd Trayer, who will cover the foothill division. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Captain Acosta and Lieutenant Donahue. It did pixelate again. I don't know if you could reset it. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, council members, and happiest of holidays to all of you. I hope it's going well for you. Uh, I am the Foothill Division Captain, and it covers about five uh, districts, uh, five council districts. And today, I just want to update you on what we are doing in the Foothill Division. I can tell you that the supervisors and officers that are working the walking beat in Foothill Division are most of them are officers and supervisors in Foothill Division. So what they're doing is complementing their regular workday and making it safer for the community and also for themselves to increase the quality of life, which is great. I'm gonna present the financials today on the foot patrols. 
uh, that we're that we're using where we are right now. And I'm proud and impressed with what the teams are doing in our area. I think I think you will be too. I also feel heavily supported by all of council um, on these walking beats. We're lucky to have them and to have the funding for this. And I can't thank you enough for for what you're giving us. We're doing the best we can with the money that we have. Next slide, please. As far as spending goes, Foothill Division has allocated money this year. Uh, before it was uh, a pool of money that each of the captains used before. Uh, this year we have $146,000. We've spent 49,000, which is 34% of average or par. Uh, par right now is at 39%. Um, and that was at the time we did these slides. So um, I've spent a little more money since, but I can tell you that I believe we're using the funding wisely. Uh, we are definitely focusing on areas that benefit from the walking beat. And I'll jump over to staffing, please. It did pixelate there again, so maybe it'll uh, reset. There you go. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's very busy in the Foothill Division, as all the divisions. And although we don't have the downtown per se, I venture to guess that the shopping centers in Foothill Division are as packed as ever right now as I drive through them. And we are adapting our walking beats to create a higher visibility and maximize our contacts with the community and with businesses and also impact the quality of life issues. It is working. Normally we have walking beats on Thursdays and Saturdays, but we've recently adapted that to Fridays and Saturdays because of the high number of uh, calls for service, the higher foot traffic and the pedestrian numbers that are in the area. And there's also just a higher likelihood that our visibility is gonna impact crime, which is important. Shopping centers are big right now. It's a big focus for the walking beats as that's where most of the incidents do take place. The hours are on there. Oh, I don't think I put them on the slide, but the hours are usually evenings or afternoons, depending on um, staffing and also depending on where the, when the calls for service are occurring. It is uh, operations I've found are more impactful when I have four officers working and a sergeant. Um, I can't do that every day because of the, the staffing and, or the uh, numbers and the staffing, but I do see a higher amplified impact when I do have four officers uh, with one sergeant. Next slide, please. Thank you. As far as the de deployment, um, I have fortunately had the ability to fill my officer and sergeant positions every time. Um, we have changed a few times in, in light of accommodating the schedule of the officers that usually come in before they do a full shift. Um, and it just, just kind of allows them to go from transition from the walking beat to their actual beat assignments. So the norm right now is one officer and two or two officers and a sergeant. And we adapt that based on our financing, like uh, when, we, when we have a little bit of extra money and things have happened in the division and also the calls for service. There's also uh, times where the community reaches out to either myself or the council members or the council members teams and tell us some significant issues that are happening that aren't normally part of our walking beat, but we do send the officers over. So although we've listed seven or eight, most of us did on our, our memorandums, the reality is, is they adapt weekly to the community, which I think is the malleable part of this program and makes it even more powerful. As far as impact goes, um, I, can't, I, I can't overestimate the amount of contacts the officers are having with the community members and businesses both. Um, it's thousands of contacts. I, every, every report I read about it, it's just uh, contacting people and they're talking about big things like the STOP program or trespassing issues in areas abandoned vehicles and giving resources and even taking care of the abandoned vehicles when they can. And also being around during major incidents because they do happen when the officers are out there and they get flagged down for um, by community members. As far as standout incidents, there, um, there, there were some pretty big ones and I think we all have some, but I did wanna share to you kind of the, the um, collateral win from these walking beats. There have been times where People have complained about aggressive panhandling and the officers might go up and speak to someone. And there's been times where that's led to an arrest for a major felony arrest on a person with a violent uh, history who is a gang member, that type of thing. I have countless numbers of times where officers have walked up to people or vehicles and contacted them as the community members mentioned issues. And those people have had guns on them or in their vehicle, loaded guns that are illegally possessed. And even one time sticks out to me where officers were um, walking in their walking beat and there was a felony hit and run. Somebody hit a car and took off and the victim was the person driving the vehicle who was there was injured. The officers ran right over and provided immediate first aid. 
So the benefits uh, like that are unpredictable, but a huge win for the community. Uh, the next slide for our future, please. We're gonna continue to monitor the high need areas. We do that every week and there are reports that come to me. I meet with the officers and the sergeants that patrol uh, the walking beats in the foothill division. They triage the big issues with me and then I reach out with them to homeless concerns, to um, dumping, to the city PRNS for dumping, graffiti programs and issues in the creek with Valley Water and those entities. We've been very successful, I think, at cleaning up some big areas. Uh, that would be a, a, a different presentation a lot longer, but uh, cleaning up some of these areas, they take time, but realistically, when we all work together, we do make a dent in those areas. Um, I'm still keeping, I think, my council members and their staff in the loop with big things that are happening in their district. And then when I hear their issues from community members, we can work on it with our walking beat. Uh, and we continue to track to make sure that we are giving equity to all the different districts. And at the same time, um, I'm giving the uh, the head, the uh, the high fives to the officers and the sergeants that are doing some great work on their time. They're giving up their time to do the walking beats for all of us in San Jose. I'm gonna pause and um, before I pass it to Captain Dwyer, I will see if, if we have any questions or Council Member Perales, as you said, we might wait till the end. Yeah, we're gonna just hold off to the end. Okay, thank you. Captain Dwyer, it's all yours. Okay, it looks like, a, uh, like Todd said, it's a little uh, pixelated. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jason Dwyer. I'm the Southern Division Captain for the San Jose Police Department. Uh, good afternoon. Happy holidays, as Todd mentioned, to uh, the chairperson and all the council members that are uh, members of the uh, FISFIS committee. Um, next slide, please. So again, we're just going to get right into the numbers here, obviously. Um, going back to FY 2019-2020 and 2020-2021, we didn't have the same model that we have here today. Uh, money was spent on these walking patrols, and I think that the department was kind of feeling itself out as, as far as how we were going to, uh, you know, have that money dispersed between the different divisions. Uh, this is the first year that we've been given a, a solid number uh, that basically we are held to a par, what we call a par. And right now, uh, the Southern Division is at 82,000 of 146. We're about 70% of par, which is quite a bit higher. Uh, I'll get into that later uh, in this slideshow here, but uh, you see last year we spent 190. Uh, this year we've been allotted 146,000, which is significantly less. So uh, coming into Southern Division, you know, we're, we're looking at ways that we can leverage uh, not only the overtime that is spent here uh, during this presentation, but also there are things happening in the background in straight straight time patrol that we're doing uh, as far as hotspot policing goes. And uh, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later. But right now uh, we're tracking a little bit ahead of schedule, um, but I'll tell you how we're tempering that uh, in just a second. Next slide, please. So when I inherited uh, this program, uh, it, it fluctuates. I mean, these. I, I, the one thing I'd like to say to the committee is that these numbers, and I think it's probably true of all the captains, is that you know when you say one sergeant, four officers, and now it's one sergeant, two to four officers, uh, those numbers go up and down depending on how many people are available, how many people volunteer for the jobs uh, and the captains, how the captains moderate those deployments. Uh, right now, for as an example, because uh, I elevated those levels uh, during what I called an emergency violence reduction plan uh, between September 20th and October 20th, they skyrocketed. Well, now we're dialing them back. So we, we don't just across the board uh, push a button and say one sergeant, two officers to go out there and uh, do high vi visibility policing, community policing. Uh, we temper it to what's going on. And, and that really is, a, is an example of us being responsive to the community and responsive and having our finger on the pulse of the neighborhood. So right now, uh, as it stands, it's generally one officer, I'm sorry, one sergeant, two officers, um, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays in Southern Division. Uh, the reason for that is those are the days off that these officers have. They're doing it on their days off. They're doing it on overtime. Uh, they're mostly junior officers, so you can imagine they're working on the weekends. So during the middle of the week, they're coming into the Southern Division and volunteering for these uh, programs. And the hours across the board are from 4.30 p.m. to 9.30 uh, p.m. Next slide, please. 
Uh, as mentioned before, uh, the deployment model, this, this slide here for me is just gonna be a little primer uh, for the next slide, but the deployment model obviously is to go out and have non-enforcement contacts, um, high visibility. So we want officers in uniform. We want blue and white cars out there. We want people to see the police. It's obviously uh, a deterrent to crime, but it also bridges that gap between the community and law enforcement. And that's what we need to form that partnership that we need uh, for community policing to solve uh, problems of crime and, and neighborhood conditions that lead to crime, including blight, graffiti, um, loitering, things of that sort. The impact has been, um, the, the way that we measure the impact uh, is anecdotal and it's also through statistics. So we have technology within the police department. We use the Crime View dashboard. We use business intelligence and we measure numbers. We measure not only the level of crime, but we measure how many times uh, somebody calls the police in a, in a given footprint. I can, I have the capability, all the captains have the capability to literally look at a map, draw uh, a perimeter around a neighborhood and ask the question, how many times did somebody call the police in the last month? How many times did somebody stop a car in the last month? How many times did the officers proactively without anybody asking them, well, I'm asking them because I'm their captain, but without any of the community members asking them to go out there and proactively touch what I call touch a spot. And what I like to do uh, is compare, you know, how many proactive touches we get against uh, reactive calls for service. Future plans, obviously, uh, a lot of what we're talking about here depends on funding. Uh, and, and what we do is, uh, is really, we, we have to stay within the four corners of our budget. And, and that's why we have to have that ebb and flow of, you know, when something happens, you push resources, and that means overtime into that spot. Uh, but when there's, a, when there's kind of a lull, in, in activity, then you can dial it back. And at the end of the year, the idea is to be even and uh, be within par. Uh, next slide, please. So the first uh, bullet point I'd like to draw your attention to um, is really increase visibility. Um, we have two project hope areas in uh, South San Jose. One of them is Round Table. Uh, the other one is Hop in Via Monte. Um, work very closely with uh, Greg Cajina from the city and Diana Garcia. Uh, Greg Cajina uh, handles uh, Hopman Viamonte, Diana Garcia handles Roundtable. And what we do is we, we meet uh, as often as, as possible and try to look at, we, we get kind of granular in those meetings. We look at specific things that we can do to move the needle. And what I mean by that is it could be something as simple as a one, you know, recurring co complaint that keeps coming up and you know I'll assign somebody to go out and do that and generally speaking who I assign is basically one of those walking beats so as uh, you know Captain Trayer mentioned earlier you know when you have somebody assigned to those things they go out there they, they make a difference and those those individuals see that not only are we being responsive to them but we don't just it's not a one and done uh, these neighborhoods are high needs neighborhoods and you know we would be naive to think that we could push a button solve one problem one time and move on. Uh, they require maintenance after we solve that problem. Um, and that, that's part and parcel with community policing. Uh, we also use crime data. Uh, we recently, uh, in our department, I don't know that it's, uh, that, that a lot of people know this, but we, we've been giving a lot of, we've been given a lot of crime analysis data from the crime analysis unit. One of the, the things that uh, the chiefs, uh, Chief Mata, Chief, uh, um, uh, Deputy Chief McFadden have pushed out recently and Assistant Chief Paul Joseph is uh, business intelligence. So whereas I used to go to, all the captains used to go to the, the crime analysis unit for information, uh, we've been empowered and trained to do our own uh, data mining in, in, a, in a program called business intelligence. And we, we, we quarterly present to the chiefs on this data. And it has been a force multiplier because it frees up our analysts and crime analysis to do real time crime analysis and try to forecast crime and, and figure out where best to re, uh, deploy all of our resources. Uh, but, but it also enriches the captains and brings us kind of closer to the numbers and, and really makes us kind of dig. Uh, and, and we, I, uh, I think I was the first one I called myself the canary. I actually presented first and I utilized my business intelligence data uh, to present on the crime numbers uh, to the chiefs last week and it went very well. So we do use crime data, but we, we're no longer uh, reliant on a separate unit, your captains uh, in every division in San Jose Police, based on the, the guidance from the chiefs now, it, uh, is that we, we do our own data mining. And uh, I, can, I can roll out of bed at 2 a.m., log on, crunch the numbers, and have them ready for any chief at, at 6 a.m. and say, this is what the, the footprint is uh, as of this is the date range and the time range. 
So that's pretty, pretty huge. In 23 years of law enforcement, that's, um, I'm not a numbers guy. I don't, I don't math, but, but, but now I do, I guess. So it's kind of cool. And then lastly, uh, community input, uh, which is huge. Uh, we, we get a lot of community input, not only from the meetings, neighborhood association meetings, neighborhood watch meetings, but also from going out. Uh, I drive my hotspots about twice a week. Uh, I do talk to people. I do get out of the car. I do knock on doors. Uh, I, you know, I, I get, you know, casework uh, through email from different council members. And, uh, you know, the, the officers that are out there doing that, uh, they're, they're, again, it's a force multiplier. They're out there for five hours and they're hitting all of the hotspots in South San Jose, which is, which is huge because oftentimes, you know, it's busy. And the patrol officers, even though we do have an ancillary hotspot policing program in on-duty patrol, we have to balance that with what's going on as far as calls for service, call volume. If it's a busy night, they're, they're just not gonna get to that community policing portion of it as far as going out and having those non-enforcement contacts. They're too busy handling calls for service. So when you talk about foot patrols, you're actually talking about uh, kind of bridging that gap between having a, a, a low staff police department who really has the right mindset, but doesn't have the personnel to necessarily roll it out the way we would like to, it bridges that gap. So that's huge. Uh, the next dot there is uh, collaboration with other city departments, council, council member offices, neighborhood associations and businesses. As I said, we do get a lot of emails uh, when I go to uh, meetings or attend them on Zoom. I get my email out pretty freely. Uh, the officers basically will receive guidance from me through email to go out and handle uh, specific what we call fires. You know, you put fires on. If there's a hot spot here or there's something's flaring up, whatever it is, if it's a community concern, I'll just say, hey, go out there and take a look at it, poke around, but, you know, tell me what's going on. I, I don't know if it's a problem, but you know, once you get eyes on the problem, uh, then you have an opportunity to basically uh, report back to the captain and say, we went out there, this is what happened. I can report back to either the community member, the business uh, owner, the council member, and say, this is what happened. Um, and, and that's really about being responsive. And that's the guidance that we get from the top is you know, one, one of our most basic functions uh, as captains in our divisions is to be responsive. Nobody wants to uh, continue to pick up the phone or send an email uh, and try to contact somebody and just hear hear nothing in return. Uh, that's unacceptable to us. And so we take that very seriously. And at the bottom there, you see, uh, we monitor the impacts, uh, hotspot policing again in patrol in Southern. And I believe uh, Deputy Chief McFadden wants to roll out a, a, a larger scale of this in patrol of just really assigning officers and, and teams to patrol certain hotspot areas. And, and how do we designate the hotspots? Either they're project hope areas, uh, they have elevated calls for service, they're known for crime and blight, and or uh, you know, other anecdotal ways, either through a council member's office or through uh, you know, neighborhood community uh, meetings. Um, and lastly, again, we have the, the uh, I won't belabor this, but we, we've got the technology, all the captains have the technology to measure how many times we proactively touch an area versus how many times we respond. Uh, me personally, I'd like the proactives, I'd like the, the officers going into those neighborhoods to outnumber the number of calls for service that we get, because that means, uh, you know, we're, you know, what I've seen is a negative correlation. When, when we positively touch an area, uh, more and more crime uh, and or calls for service go down. Uh, and I've presented that, that data to the chiefs repeatedly. Uh, hotspot policing is a proven tactic. It's been used across the country. Uh, and that's really what hotspot policing and, and the walking beat really uh, contribute, contributes to that as well. Next slide, please. Uh, these are just a, this is not fluff. Um, you know, you need to know what it looks like. You know, this is officers, uh, you know, our youth are one of our most valuable commodities in San Jose. Uh, I have kids, everybody up there has kids. Uh, when we can push officers into that space and set a positive role model for our youth, and uh, particularly in, in high needs areas where our, our schools are ripe for uh, as, as recruiting grounds for gangs. Absolutely, we need to push officers into that space and you know, give them an ice cream cone out of our truck, uh, hand out some, some gift bags or just you know, do a little presentation. Uh, so absolutely, um, you know, as, as the other captains had mentioned previously, going out there and having non-enforcement contacts with the community is, is critical. Uh, it, it just, you know, people, people need to get to know each other so that they can trust each other, talk to each other and, and get along. And I think um, that's not unique to San Jose, that's everywhere. But uh, next slide, please. 
So this one is kind of a darker slide, but I'd like to uh, drive the point home that, you know, the officers that go out there and do this work and are non-enforcement based, and, and they're trying to, uh, you know, knock on doors, talk to people, uh, bridge gaps, you know, break down barriers, they're still police officers. And when they see criminal activity or something's not right, uh, they take action. Uh, the, the two pistols that you see, uh, one came from Great Oaks Park. Uh, I don't remember where the other one came from, but you can see there's a lot of narcotics there as well. So you know, have a drug dealer who's carrying, uh, both of those are, are ghost Glock pistols, by the way, for anybody who's taking notes, they're not actual Glock pistols, they're ghost Glocks, they're not serialized, which is a huge, another huge issue that I believe our chiefs are, are uh, tackling right now. Uh, but one of the things that I wanna draw your attention to is the shotgun. Uh, if you look at the shotgun and the shells, it was fully loaded. Um, it's got an extended magazine. That shotgun, so our walking beat officers contacted an individual in one of our hotspots. Nobody went to jail. Uh, it, was, it was a conversation. But because of that conversation, because the officers built up that rapport and had that non-enforcement uh, contact, that individual felt compelled to give up what we call a, a, a community gun and gave a description of an area where a shotgun was buried and it was known to a lot of gang members and it was a community gun. Anybody who wanted to dig it up and needed to use it to try and shoot somebody, it was there. And uh, so they, they, they thanked that individual. They went about their business at the end of their shift. They went out there and kind of snooped around and, and dug it up. That gun was buried in the ground and our officers found it and dug it up uh, out of the ground. And, and that individual told the truth. So that's the kind of thing that you can expect from our walking beat officers. That, that's not patrol, that's not special operations. These are the walking beats. This is the type of uh, product that they're putting forth. It's not all just non-enforcement. Sometimes they see something that doesn't pass the smell test and what you're seeing on the screen right now is, is the result of that. So with that, I'll take any questions. No, 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 yeah, no, sorry. Right? no worries, no worries, yeah, thank you. Stephen, it's uh, pixelated. If you could go to the next slide, please. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Brian Shab, I'm the Western Division Captain. Um, happy holidays, uh, and thanks for having us in Piss Fest today. Um, I'll be going over uh, the walking beat patrols for Western Division. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as, be, as has been mentioned, um, this is the first year that we've had an allocated budget um, in prior years. It was a citywide budget, uh, but only two of those years. Uh, were they for um, Western Division, uh, Foothill, and, and uh, Southern? So in uh, 1920, um, we had about $88,000 uh, that was expended in the Western Division. And then in 2021, that number increased uh, significantly to about $268,000 uh, in Western Division. In the current fiscal year, we were allocated uh, 167 thousand dollars and as uh, captain acosta mentioned the reason why that number is slightly larger than both uh, southern and foothill was because there's an encumbrance of twenty thousand five hundred uh, dollars left over from last year that was added to this year's budget you'll also notice that we're sig significantly over par in western division we've spent one hundred forty thousand dollars of that money to date uh, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is uh, here shortly. Next slide. So uh, past deployment models are, are uh, similar to what you've already seen and current deployment models, models are also similar to what you've already seen. Um, in the past, we've gone uh, one sergeant and four officers, uh, Monday through Friday, five hours uh, a day, varying times, um, primarily daytime and early evening hours. Currently, um, I have deployed so far this year, both uh, one sergeant and two officers and one sergeant and four officers. And that really comes down to the need uh, and the task that they've been giving um, in that walking beat. Uh, we've pushed out from Monday to Friday to Monday through Saturday. Currently, officers are being deployed Mondays, Thursdays, and Saturdays in various neighborhoods uh, throughout the city. We've, because we're uh, significantly over par, we're pulling back uh, the deployment in Western to try and get that budget back down under control a bit. 
Um, and so we're really only out one day. Right now, we're only out one day a week, and that's Saturday. Um, we are deploying five hours uh, a day, and I typically like to deploy um, from the 4.30 p.m. to uh, 9.30 p.m. range. And the reason for that is um, a couple fold. One is it allows day shift officers to go right from their normal working day into the walking beat. And so um, it makes it convenient for them, which makes it easy to fill for, for us. Um, but the other thing that it does is that it gets officers out in that time frame that I think is most critical for the task that they're given, and that's building community relationships, right? So I want the officers out in these neighborhoods when the kids are getting home from school, um, when the parents are uh, getting home from school. You know, a lot of these neighborhoods that, that we're serving, um, they're latchkey kids. They're, they're just like I was when I grew up. They come home from school. Um, parents aren't home yet from, you know, their first, second, or even third job. Um, and so they're outside playing. And, you know, one of the, the many benefits to this program is the officers can be out there when these kids are out and they're, they're almost, um, well, not almost, they are acting as like a second uh, layer of guardianship and, and mentorship uh, and being there for the kids uh, when they get home. And then also, like I said, as the, uh, as the parents are arriving home from work, um, it's the officers are out in that time when they can go make contact and, and, uh, build those relationships. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to talk about, just like uh, the other captains have, we're going to talk about uh, some of the division-specific deployment models for Western Division. We're going to talk about the impact, and we're going to talk about the future plans. And I've, uh, those are best illustrated on the, the following slide, so I'll go straight to those. Uh, next slide, please. One more time there, please. Okay, there you go, thank you. Um, you heard Captain Dwyer talking about uh, business intelligence and our crime analysis unit and the, the data that we're able to, to uh, gain now. And, and this is an example of that. What you're looking at is a heat map, um, just one of many types of um, plotting that crime analysis allows us to do in our divisions, um, separating out uh, data from robberies, aggravated assaults, different, uh, different fiscal periods throughout the year, different uh, divisions, different districts. We can dial all the way down to the individual districts uh, within our divisions and pull some of this data. And so when we talk about our deployment models and how, and how I deploy in Western Division, this is a big part of it. So uh, there's, there's really two, two focuses that I like to look at when deploying uh, walking beat officers. One is to respond to emerging trends of violent crime. Um, and that's what we're doing here with, with some of these beat maps. So on a weekly basis, um, we'll pull up business intelligence and or crime view dashboard, and we'll look to see what's happening right now, real time in the division. And so that we can identify emerging trends and respond to them quickly, because we all know the quicker we respond, um, the easier it is for us to get some of these things under control. And so what you're looking at there is a heat map for the entire year, uh, fiscal year of 2021 uh, to date um, for robberies. And you'll see that there is certainly a, a hot spot there right around um, Vietnam, time, uh, Vietnam Town and uh, Grand Century Mall, Little Saigon. And that's one of the areas where uh, we experienced uh, over the last year a significant spike in um, hate-related uh, violent crime in terms of robberies. So that was an area where it's one of the reasons why, quite frankly, that the numbers are so high in um, Western Division deployment is because it was imperative to get officers out there to respond to that spike in violent crime. Um, those officers' presence absolutely deter deters crime while they're there. Um, next slide, please. This is a similar uh, heat map, but this time for aggravated assaults in Western Division. And, and as you can see, um, there's a lot of hotspots there. Unfortunately, there's way more than I'd like to see there, but you'll see uh, neighborhoods uh, like Santee, 
who experienced, um, you know, a significant spike in violent gang crime uh, to include three homicides over the course of a year. Um, so that was another area where we made sure that we had to deploy officers uh, on a very, very consistent basis, four officers at a time, to try and help aid in curbing uh, that spike in violent crime. You'll see areas like, you know, Cadillac and Winchester, Guadalupe, Washington, um, areas that we've known for generations that have been hot spots, right? Continue to be hot spots. And so we're deploying officers and walking beats in those areas. Um, and then you'll see emerging trends in there um, where you'll see a, a, a rise in uh, violent crime and aggravated assaults at Second Street Studios and Renaissance Place, both of which are in Western Division, both of which are new permanent supportive housing complexes in the city that um, we are doing everything we possibly can to ensure that those developments are successful, um, but we're also responding to a high call volume of uh, service and some, and some, quite frankly, some violent crime in those areas. So we're trying to make sure that those resources are in those areas when we see those problems. But I talked about um, it being kind of twofold. One, like I just mentioned, identifying and responding to emerging trends. But the second part is, I would say equally, if not more important. Next slide, please. One more time. There we go. Um, and that's that's our future generation, right? So these these are the these are the kids that we're trying to impact, and this is who we're doing this work for, right? Um, we have a lot of high needs neighborhoods in the Western Division. Um, a lot of these high needs neighborhoods are ones that are not going to come as a shock to you that they've they've been there like i said earlier for generations and uh you know i'm a san jose kid born and raised i grew up in, in uh in one of these high needs neighborhoods in district three so uh i can tell you what it's like and the way that we're going to make a difference is long term in these neighborhoods um you know, what we just talked about in, in setting officers out there to, to address these emerging trends, those are, those are short-term goals. Where I think the biggest benefit to this program is what we're gonna see long-term with this. Um, we, we, these neighborhoods, like I said, we go out there and the young kids that are out there, it's, they, they still love us. Uh, they still come up and they ask for stickers, they ask for ice cream and it's great. But if it's just a, a, a quick stop and then you're gone, um, you don't build the relationships, right? And that next generation, unfortunately, becomes the, the problems that we're faced, that we're dealing with 15 years down the road. The goal is here is to create that next generation to be the solution, to stop that cycle. Um, so that uh, I'll draw your attention to that, to the photo there in the middle with those, uh, those two officers and our, our two future recruits. Uh, those two officers uh, work that they work that district on a regular basis. That's their normal district, and they go out there walking beat after their shift, and they get out there and they meet these kids. And it took about six months for these two officers, in particular, to really garner the respect uh, and the trust of that community. And that's, that's particularly that that one down there, Santee. Um, and after meeting with these kids. Uh, buying them pizza out of their own pocket, bringing them ice cream out of their own pocket. Um, the two the two little girls came up with their moms um, and they told them that they wanted to now be police officers, not just for Halloween, this was taken in Halloween, but they wanna be police officers when they grow up. And I think that is where we're gonna make a difference in this, this program is we have a consistent uh, deployment of officers out there, building those relationships so that when these kids grow up, um, they've seen the right model of behavior. They've seen what uh, what they can accomplish and what can be done. And and that's where I see the future uh, of this of this walking beat is is in the the long term effects. And with that, uh, I think we're, we're all done. So I think we can probably open up to questions uh, if you're good with that, Chair. Yeah, thank you. Um... We'll go over to our public commenters first, uh, but I'll just say that um, this entire presentation uh, was the absolute best sales pitch 
possible to make uh, the walking beats permanent. And so I'm just going to play this back for the chief um, year over year. And so thank you for, for that. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll turn it over to our, our uh, community members first. Uh, each will have two minutes. And uh, first up, we have Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, good afternoon, Council and uh, Chief Mata and uh, uh, Captain Acosta, Treyer, and uh, and uh, uh, Captain Shaw. Thank you for your participation in the uh, Guana meetings. Um, Rosalinda, really, really appreciate. I appreciate it because I watch the videos. Sometimes they coincide with council meetings, and I don't have time to to watch them. And but I go back after, and I watch them in their entirety. And so I really appreciate your advocacy uh, with respect to the Guana neighborhood. I grew up right there on state. 40 years I lived right there on the corner of state in Virginia. And so I know that barrio. Nobody knows that barrio better than me. They just don't. Or participate on this level from that barrio, as I do. I do this, I, I put in at least 150 hours a month. And that's just attendance at these meetings. I don't get paid one dollar, not a dime from nobody. I do it because I care about my neighborhood. I know what happened to that barrio. I know the, get the redlining map, get the redlining map and put it on these barrios. They're the same. It's been that way for even before I was born. It was been, it had been that way ever since that redlining map came on. So what I would like to see is I would like to see that redlining map put on these maps. Now, there's a presumption of innocence, and, and Captain Dwyer, Captain Dwyer said flat out, we're going to forecast crime. You can't forecast crime, homeboy. That's probable cause. And there's a presumption of innocence that is afforded to every single citizen. I don't care if he's wearing baggy pants or, he's, or she's walking with a Fendi bag. She's just as capable of a crime as he is. So this, this forecasting crime and using your data to do it, that's dangerous. You were walking a very fine line by doing something like that because there is a presumption of innocence and that is a violation of due process of law. Okay, next up will be Blair Beekman. All right, thank you, Blair Beekman. Some interesting last words from Paul. Thank you. Uh, predictive policing is a, is, a, is a forum that really needs good civil protection practices with it. Uh, thanks for Paul's words. Um, this was a really interesting item for myself uh, as well in his presentation. Uh, you talked about uh, beat issues and uh, waited till the very end to talk about uh, statistics, to offer some statistics. Uh, I could have used a bit more statistics and a bit more of the importance of uh, what a walking beat, its purpose can serve and what it can really do. You gave some good examples. Uh, uh, where, where it's such a time of law enforcement concerns that, uh, you know, and crime issues that uh, the presentation was very gentle and nice. And I thank you for that very much. Uh, what, what can be ways, you know, I have a, this problem myself of being a bit too indirect. What exactly can be the ways we can start addressing law enforcement uh, crime concerns better at this time, actually, is my question. Uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, you know, surveillance and technology issues that I've been trying to discover how we could work towards a more well-rounded approach to this subject. It's, it's a bunch of things working together at the same time. And that way we can be considering the ideas of reimagine and equity and health and human services at this time. How do we bring in those concepts and talking about the importance of a walking beat and what that can, what that offers, the good it offers. Um, what about uh, co the community officers? They, they drive around in the white patrol cars. Uh, we, we, that, that conversation needs to happen more. How can they be brought into this picture for local neighborhoods and a softness to, to address uh, crime issues and presence issues? And uh, thanks for your time in this item. All right, thank you. Next up will be Brian. Thank you, uh, sir. Thank you, officer. Thank you, chief, for uh, doing what you do. Uh, I'd like to, and it sort of addresses the downtown high and all that, it is that as citizens, you know, and everybody's a citizen, it doesn't matter, quote unquote, um, 
what Paul added was really true. I have looked at those red lines and it's, it, it's a legacy that we have to deal with directly as people um, and as a society. Uh, on the, uh, on the one, I think what I'm just trying to share is just one person's opinion of how we have to acquiesce. People running around in the middle of the street, people screaming and yelling, people um, going after you in your car. You can't have you can't have anything delivered to your house. It will be stolen. Period. So you have to acquiesce. You have to have it delivered here. Go pick it up at UPS. People take your mail. They take your catalytic converter. They take anything that's nailed in your car. And there was a big bust and all that. But all those stories, every one of those catalytic converters, cost someone thousands of dollars to replace. And that's not discussed. That's that's the acquisition that we lock it up. Do this. Do that. A person who is a victim of a crime did nothing wrong period that's how it has to be it's not stated that way i've been ripped off a bazillion times and i'm always made to feel like an idiot uh especially trying to fill out the reports and you know, you're just trying to get your report filled out because your insurance requires it and it takes forever to do that um police can't respond they can't be everywhere i get all, get all that um but it's as citizens we have to continue to acquiesce to people who choose not to abide by the rules. And that's going to continue. Honestly, none of that's ever going to change. We've walked over that line and it's just not going to go back. And that's sad that, you know, we live basically in a prison <laughs> and I don't, I hate feeling that way. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Brian. Um, we'll bring it back to members of the committee. I did see Scott Largent's hand up and then he went down. So if you want to throw oh, there you go. Um, let's let's let uh, Scott Larger go ahead and finish up, and then uh, we'll, we'll end public comment. Thank you. Hopefully, everyone can hear me. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, great, great. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> the, listening to the talk about uh, the San Jose Police Department doing more of the of the foot patrol and the walking beat, I, I fully support that. Um, what I'm bringing up right now is interactions that I have now with my daughter when I take her to parks in San Jose. Um, some of these areas 15, 20 years ago were pretty sketchy, but you know they've cleaned up a lot, but I'm just worried that they're just kind of ignored. Um, I, I, I would have, how many times that I've been to Starbird Park and several around the corner from there, um, I, I would have liked to have seen law enforcement doing a walkthrough, coming through and saying hi to the kids, um, seeing that ice cream truck and, you know, actually functioning. And, you know, I, I'm waiting to see that type of stuff. I, I don't want my kid to be anti-cop. I'm not anti-cop. You know, I, I was kind of waiting for that opportunity. And it just hasn't quite happened at the park there. Uh, the interactions that we've been having there lately are the severely mentally ill that are on some type of psychosis ending up in the middle of the playgrounds. They're ending up in the fields. Um, and it's hard to figure out how to explain this to a five, a six-year-old, or all the other children out in the playground. It'd be helpful maybe if law enforcement came out there every once in a while and explained to them that people do have issues and problems, and, you know, kind of how to handle it. Um, we had the fire department out there one time, San Jose Police Department out there for a woman that was just, just batty out of her mind, just big, big time psychosis. And there was nothing they could really do. Um, I understand these holds don't work that well, but I would have appreciated having that woman pulled out of the situation that she was in because it's very hard to explain this to all the kids at the rec center on, on the playground. And there was also a homicide that happened out there, and it was hard to explain to all the children why the candles were there and what's going to happen. We kind of need some guidance as dads out there. All right, now we'll come back to members of the committee. Uh, first up will be Councilmember Mahan. Thank you, Chair, appreciate it. Um, thank you uh, to all of you for the really detailed report and um, an update on your activities. And thank you for what you're doing out there on the streets. This seems very effective. I'm a big supporter of the foot patrols. Um, you know, the only real question I had as you were going through this was just thinking about what it would look like for us to get to a place where we can scale this up and make it more sustainable. I mean, clearly we're we're funding and staffing this in a very ad hoc way. And I, I guess the, the way I'd frame up the question, but tell me if I'm asking it the wrong way, is what is the overall level of staffing we think we'd need to reach before this could be a more permanent and sustainable 
feature of our um, of what our department does and how we serve the public. Again, big believer in it, but I recognize the constraints we're currently under. Thank you. Sure, I can uh, help you with Go that, uh, Council Member. Um, when you you asked, uh, currently I'm working on a uh, strategic plan here for the police department, and also a, a staffing plan that we're going to uh, bring forward here and for the next budget cycle. And uh, part of that is uh, to increase or see uh, how we can increase our staffing. And, uh, and under the heading of foot patrols, uh, my vision uh, would be to, as you heard. Each captain, they're doing an amazing job with the resources that they have, and uh, we can do more uh, because we know that there's um, plenty of uh, work to do out there, as I uh, had just mentioned by uh, some of the, um, the speakers. So um, what, I, what we envision, uh, along with um, the captains and uh, Deputy Chief McFadden, is uh, having uh, two teams uh, for each, each division, right, for both sides of the week uh, that are sustainable, that are there uh, on a consistent basis. So that will require a total of 16 officers, right? Uh, so four, so eight um, officers for each division. Um, um, so again, that's something that um, you know, we'll, we'll take a look at um, to see how we can, uh, or how, how that would look uh, to have those teams uh, just dedicated to uh, foot patrols, um, as mentioned, uh, for visibility, to address uh, crime and quality of life issues, but more importantly, to uh, build that uh, community trust. Because, uh, like I mentioned at the start of this, uh, these foot patrols are at the heart of what we do here um, in community policing. Great, yeah, I completely agree. I appreciate that, Chief. I'm a huge believer in it and very, very supportive. Look forward to uh, going through your strategic plan and uh, hope we're hope we're all hope we're able to support it. And I want to give. Captain Dwyer, a special shout out to the investment in Hoffman Viamonte. It's made a big difference. We had a rough uh, stretch earlier this year and we're a little worried about uh, where that might be heading, but I, I think the work you all have done on the ground is, has been just tremendous. So thank you all again, appreciate it. And uh, that's all for me, Chair. Great, thank you. Any other comments or questions from members of the committee? Vice Mayor Jones. Uh, yes, I just wanna uh, just pile on and, and just say, uh, how impressive uh, that presentation was. I think we we're all big believers in, in this program. It's the true definition of community policing. And uh, I wanna give my captain, Captain Shab, a, a shout out for the outstanding work that he's doing in, in my district. And I also wanna give Captain Treyer a shout out just for being uh, an outstanding resident in my district. And um, so I, again, I just wanna just, um, reiterate some of the numbers, uh, Chief. So you're saying that in your request, that you're gonna request eight additional officers per division, or did I understand that those numbers correctly? Um, I'm so, um, if you would like to give me eight, I'll take them, but uh, I just looked at my calculations. Uh, I'm sorry, it's four, four per division. Uh, so four for each division would be a total of 16 officers. Because I because I heard eight, so I did. You know, I, you know my, my hearing could have been correct. You know, I did. I did okay. say eight, but um, I'm sure uh, our detective bureau can uh, use the other uh, officers. Okay, just so you know that I did hear eight <laughs> as you're you know working through your numbers. But but thank you, uh, Chief, and again uh, thank you for um, all of the officers and captains and everyone in our. Police Department for the outstanding work that they're doing. Thank you. All right, uh, Councilmember Adenas. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm also going to join in with everybody else. Um, this was a really great report. It was um, very apparent that there's a lot of coordination. Um, among districts, even though um, each one has a respective, their own respective um, captain. And uh, I think that's, that's um, evident of a great leadership. And so thank you, Chief Mata, uh, for that and for our DCs, um, who are also um, in those lines um, that lead up to success. And a special thank thanks to my captain, my captain, Treyer, um, 
I think, you know, every one of us who, who has spoken has said um, something about their own uh, captain. And that just shows you how much work um, and coordination um, that, that is taking place behind the scenes. And this is for our um, audience at home. We are um, constantly, we make sure we are constantly connecting with our captains, captains to let them know some of the calls that you've made um, so that way we give voice to your concerns. But in the end, um, they go by data. And so you have to continue to keep calling. And, um, and that's one of the things I was going to ask about because um, as we know, I know, and I heard it from each and every captain, you, you take the referrals either from Project Hope, from the data, from the council offices, um, just from um, your own interactions with, with the community. And, and it was really impressive to hear that um, some, somebody gave up that commu those community guns. Uh, I don't know how often that happens. Um, I'm gonna guess that it's really rare. Um, and to me, that that is, that's the proof. Proof is in the pudding, right? That that is it. That's the kind of work that that this um, foot patrol really um, is effective and affecting. And so I'm I'm all for our foot patrol. I do recognize that there's um, always more activity in the central division, whether they want it or not. But just everybody gravitates downtown. That's where a lot of um, the activity happens, myself included. I love going downtown. Uh, I don't make trouble for Council Member Perales at all, um, but, I, but I do enjoy all of your restaurants and, and just the, the atmosphere that the downtown provides us. And so um, I totally get that, that that area has a little bit more. But I'm, I'm confused about the other districts because I think there's an even 19% uh, uh, for, the, for the West, no, no, for the Southern and for the Foothill. And then for the Western, there's like a slight difference. I think it's about roughly 22%, not, not yet to the 22%. And since we're going by data and I'm not trying to get- Sorry to interrupt, to maybe to make it easier, would, would somebody from PD mind throwing up the slide? Oh slide yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Um, Chair. Sorry, go ahead. Um, so, so one of the things that I was wondering is, I know that you get um, your referrals from us, and I know that you go by data, um, but I'm trying to understand a little bit more about how do you make this division, um, it's, it's almost an even division between Southern and Foothill, um, and I'm not competing to get more or less, I think you know the data and the activity should tell us. And some of the incidents that have happened during um, the summer. By by the way, th thank you for for all the work that you've done um, with some of the is incidents that have happened throughout this year in in my district and, and in my neighboring district seven. Um, and I'm I'm constantly hearing from my from my colleague council member Esparza how much busier the Western uh, division part of her district is, and and in in fairness, I want to see how how um, that that uh, division is made between the remaining um, districts. If so it's why okay, don't we get... I can I can answer that, Chief. If, uh, if you oh, like. thank you, Captain. Okay, thank you. I uh, thank you for the question, Councilmember Arenas. Uh, it's a good question. So, um, the way that the funds were allocated for this fiscal year is the they were they were equally distributed. The hundred and forty six thousand was equally distributed uh, across all three of the divisions. Uh, once Central got got their their portion of it. The reason why Western has an additional 20,500 is because that was uh, an encumbrance from the prior fiscal year where council member Esparza had, uh, had re requested and received uh, an additional $20,000 that was to be spent in the prior fiscal year, uh, 20 to 21, um, and it was not allocated. It was approved, but was not actually allocated into the budget and so that was carried over into this year's budget, and that's why, that's why that the additional funds are there. Yeah, and, and 
and that's not really, you know, I don't have any beef with somebody else having more than, than I, as we know that the premise of equity doesn't mean equal, right? So I, I'm not so much concerned that, that um, they, they have more in their district. I'm just wondering, how can we move towards a, a division of funds that um, correlates to the type of activity that we're seeing within each of the districts? So um, I'm not saying that my district is, doesn't pop off and it doesn't have robberies and all kinds of crimes. It does. And and um, and so it should merit the the support of the foot patrol, um, as the data tells us. And so I guess I'm wondering how how are we using the data to then further um, create some equity amongst these districts? So if Western needs to have just a little bit more than Foothill, so be it. If Southern needs to have a little bit more than my respect to Foothill, so be it. I know Captain Treyer's probably like, please stop saying that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm using just my my uh, district because I don't want to, I'm not trying to pick on anybody else's. I'm just wondering, how will we get to a point where it's, it, um, and not only is it equitable, and I heard that, that you're all moving in that direction, but that it correlates to the data. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll try to um, answer uh, some of that, uh, Council Member. Um, you know, um, as Council Costa talked about in the beginning, we're giving a, a pot of money and uh, we're trying to be equitable amongst all four uh, divisions. Right. Uh, and, and I know the uh, data that uh, we uh, referenced to is data-driven policing, right? To uh, see where those hotspots are, where those uh, areas we need to deploy um, those officers. Um, and we can, in each each division, I mean, each, each captain right. here, uh, uh, can can tell you uh, you know there's plenty of, of work uh, in their division so mm -hmm. uh, you know we just uh, divided it up equally amongst the, the divisions I, I I see uh, here by this chart uh, that uh, additional monies was uh, was giving to uh, to downtown and uh, and I think that was uh, through uh, appropriations uh, when the uh, the budget was um, was given to foot patrols uh, I know that um, you know there was extra uh, given there. I think uh, it was something right, that was, and there was uh, advocacy from. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but there was a lot of advocacy from our chair, and I I really appreciate it. This is his district; he understands it, and he understands the needs of his community, and um, and so I, you know, I I, I I'm you don't have to answer completely today. I just want to pose the question sure. so that. Um, because I've heard it from uh, Council Member Sparza, and I'm, like I said, I'm not trying to give any resources away because I know that each one of us has an area that really um, merits it and, and, and may have a certain level of activity depending on the season and the type of crime and all of that. And, um, and, and I absolutely respect all of the really good work that you're doing because one thing is, is, is um, walking those streets and I'm sure that it creates and poses a greater danger um, to our officers. And despite that, they're still creating those relationships. And so I'm, I'm really grateful and I'm thankful um, to that. So, you know, we can, we can take the conversation offline. I just, I know that I've heard this before from our council members and I want to be true to the, to, to the word of equity, um, that it, it isn't all always equal, but I'll, I'll stay with, you know, I'll, I'll move on from that. And, um, and actually link, we have a, an upcoming uh, item. And so I just wanted to link a little bit before I'm, before we close this, this particular item that what you're doing with foot patrol is, is rendering a lot of um, great relationships with the, with the community that then lead to other really great outcomes. Um, it's, we, we all know how effective it is. And so part of, part of the next item is also talking about um, the anti-hate and anti-Asian um, um, crimes that are happening. And I'm wondering how, if any way, did that, was there any ties between what was happening with our API and um, in the foot patrol, did that did that get factored in? Yeah, I, I yes, can I'll let uh, Captain uh, Chap talk about that because uh, he's done tremendous work in that in that regard. 
Uh, thank you, Chief. Uh, Council Member Reynos, absolutely, that, it, that did play a part in that. We had um, um, a significant increase in um, hate-related robberies uh, where the victims were specifically targeted uh, because uh, they're Asian females um, in the Little Saigon area. And the foot patrols play a huge part in our response to that crime. So uh, one of the reasons why um, the Western Division budget is so far over par is because we we saw the the importance um, and the need in that area to get those officers out there on a consistent basis um, and we did and um and it paid dividends I mean, we um you know the that in 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 a large part due to our our fantastic robbery detectives um and the bureau of investigations we were able to to get six suspects in custody on that and, and effectively stop uh, that, that spree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I did read about that in your report. I think they, they were from all around the Bay Area, not just from San Jose. So it just comes to show you how coordinated they were. Yeah. I, I appreciate that. Um, and the reason I just, I wanted to set that up is because uh, when our, our chief um, made a visit to our Lime Plaza in, in the district earlier this year, and I really appreciate that. Um, and you got a chance to meet, you know, some of those small business owners, uh, predominantly, of course, in Lime Plaza, it's uh, Vietnamese. Um, and then you go for the, further down and there's a little bit of uh, everything. Um, including Latino and um, you know, there's Chinese uh, American restaurants, um, just a different array of, uh, there's a lot of diverse small businesses. And I asked for a um, funding for our Tully, um, for a Tully Business Association. And I wonder how we can, and we can take this offline as well, is how can we align the work that you're all doing with the foot patrol with some of the work that is going to get done by a consultant um, to build up the Tully uh, Business Association? Um, because I know those two things go hand in hand. Um, and so since this is very specific to my district, I can, I can take it off offline. Um, but I think there's an, a, um, an opportunity to take advantage of a startup um, a business association, a small business association, so that it could also leverage the work that you're doing um, and, and continue to have eyes and ears out there um, for you uh, from our business uh, sector um, of our community. So I, I'll, I'll take that off um, a little bit uh, offline and uh, just end with, with um, um, a lot of kudos to all of the captains um, Captain Acosta, uh, Dwyer, Schaub, um, of course, my captain, my captain, <laughs> uh, Treyer. Um, I will always fight for resources, Captain Treyer. I'm not trying to give them away, but I needed to make a point. So anyways, thank you all for, for the work that you're doing. This is, um, I wasn't, at first, I wasn't entirely convinced of uh, the foot patrol, um, simply because my district is a little different, right? It's it's huge, it's huge. And I couldn't see how that could benefit um, such a large district, but these very focused, concentrated um, efforts are, are rendering so much um, that I really, you, you know, I'm, a, I'm an absolute uh, believer and supporter. And I just want to thank you once again for all the really great work. Can I ask for uh, spending make a motion to accept? Oh, motion to approve. Second. All right, we motion to second. Um, and and I uh, am glad that Councilman Renas that uh, you're buying into this. I think it's really multifaceted benefits that that we can see out of the foot patrol. Um, and uh, I'll I'll speak to that in a moment. But I do see that we have one more public commenter, and I, I believe they came for this item. So uh, I'll turn it back to them, um, Eric. Later. You should be unmuted. But we can't hear you, no? Are you, am I here now? Yes, now we can hear you. Raul? Yep, we can hear you now. Uh, try and... 
you may be having. You can some... hear me now. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, thank you for your patience here, everybody. I'm so sorry. I've got technical glitches across the board today. My name is Eric Glader, and I am uh, the executive director of the Urban Vibrancy Institute and have the pleasure of having a really nice relationship uh, with a variety of the officers on this call. And then, you know, spend a lot of time walking around uh, the city and talking with business owners and, and uh the, the one thing that, that we see that has the opportunity to truly change San Jose, no silver bullet, uh, but, but just is, is the ability to have these walking patrols on, on the streets to establish this trust with, with the community uh, and to just continue to get data points and get people on the, on the ground seeing firsthand, uh, not that they don't, but just getting, getting that on the street, on the ground feel and information from from uh, the business owners creating a, a true sense of community uh, is, is, is really something that I see uh, needed across the city. And, and recently when this was up for some American Rescue Fund money, uh, you know, we were able to mobilize 80 some people, uh, businesses, business owners, companies in, in the area as well that see the merits behind uh, this foot patrol as well and the strength that it, it provides uh, to the city. Uh, and, you know, we are just very thankful for what the officers up and down uh, the, the lineup do in, in the city. We're in Fountain Alley. We get to see every day uh, the, 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 the issues that need to be addressed. Uh, and, and there are many. Uh, and, you know, again, I just thank you for your time for coming in late, for raising my hand late. But I, I want to but yell as loud as I can in full support for, for foot patrol on the streets of, of San Jose. And, and we have a, a, a community backing this uh, desire up. I think it's something that, that San Jose's long for and would be just wonderful to see. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Ardenas? Uh, sorry, Chair, I, I, I didn't want to um, lose an opportunity to also thank my former captain, Captain Schriefer, and I see um, uh, Deputy Chief uh, Washburn and, of course, uh, Deputy, uh, Deputy Chief uh, McFadden. So thank you so much uh, for your leadership as well. I, I, you know what, at the end of this year, you think back about all the work that has been done and, um, and I got a chance to take a tour with, uh, with our police department, uh, specifically within uh, their sexual assaults unit. And I just wanna thank them um, for, for really from the bottom of my heart for all the really great work it's so different when you get to see um, face to face, right? All of the investigators and detectives and advocates that work on um, all of these cases and uh, and get to support our our community when they're in a drastic and terrible situation. And so, thank you so much for for all the really great work that you're doing. Um, that that was that was really it. Thank you, Chair. No worries. Thank you. All right, just um, a couple comments and, and uh, I think how I led after the, the presentation. Uh, the, the concept of having permanent foot patrol officers is something I've been supportive of uh, for quite some time, but, but really put some more action behind it. Over the last couple of years, it was something that uh, I was happy to ensure we had individual one-time funding year over year, at least for the downtown core. And then uh, as we started a couple years back, really broadening that citywide. Um, but I think we, we saw the ebbs and flows with that, um, being dependent on officers signing up for, for overtime hours. At times uh, it was inconsistent. And, um, and then the officers just being inconsistent as well, not having uh, potentially the same officers go out. Um, uh, you know, I think it, that, that it eliminates the opportunities for what foot patrol can really bring, which is building a rapport with the community, which um, all the captains just presented in their, their slides on. I think some of those, those added benefits that we get beyond just, you know, crime prevention, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, crime prevention, um, you have an opportunity to really engage with our community and, uh, and to build some rapport uh, that then in itself could lead to crime prevention, like um, the, the guns that uh, Captain Dwyer had demonstrated. Um, but I think also um, the opportunity, like um, I believe it was Captain Shab was showing in, in the presentation, 
of some of these youth and their um, and their connection that they'll make with with police officers. Um, but that's going to take some time. And if you have uh, inconsistency with officers, different officers coming out different days, and, and maybe you know you're you're not able to build that. Um, that's where I think I saw uh, the the one-time funding not being as successful and shifted gears and took the opportunity last um, uh, last year to, to to really focus on utilizing our redistricting process, the, the, the police department's redistricting process, to see if we could then have um, some permanent foot patrol areas uh, throughout the city, knowing that the biggest hurdle really to overcome is staffing, uh, quite frankly, right, is that even if we, you know, we can create those um, positions um, or spots that then somebody would bid on and that would be their whole, you know, shift would be, would be foot patrol um, or a walking beat. Uh, we, we need the, the resources to do so. And, and that's a back and forth that, that we go through often in this committee uh, uh, with different issues. Uh, for instance, um, right, our, our traffic enforcement unit. And uh, when we a couple of years back learned that we had gotten down to just four officers there, and uh, I was encouraging our our uh, previous chief to really ensure that we could get a couple more officers in that unit. Um, and you know now happy that we're we're back up. I believe it's around 14, but um, nowhere near where we were a decade ago uh, or just over a decade ago with 40 uh, in in TEU. Same story is is there with all the different, I think, specialized units um, and, and even the investigation bureau and, and, and patrol uh, as it is that, you know, that's our biggest hurdle is that staffing. And so knowing that, um, I do have a question for you, Chief. What, what is, and you talked a little bit about it, right? Obviously in, in regards to, to staffing up and having a plan for that. Um, but looking at it on a, on a smaller scale and maybe something that could, could be rolled in, um, in in phases, if you will, how many more staff do you think you would need before we actually could create a more permanent walking beat, even if we started in, you know, we didn't have this citywide, but we started in particular pockets and, and, um, and what do you think that would take to actually get that similar to what we saw with TEU? Um, you know, I think, right, you were able to allocate a, a few more or, or um, right, our previous chief was able to allocate a few more bodies over there, um, right, that, that, hinders your ability to to fill holes other places um but i'd like to see what your thought is on that um so happy to hear your, your thoughts sure thank you chair uh so yes my my thoughts would be just like as you mentioned right these these have to be stable has to be consistent um uh, the captains are doing a, tr a great job of uh, leveraging the um the resources that they have uh, which are officers that are working Currently in, in that in those districts and, and those divisions, uh, to uh, supplement or to add on these uh, foot patrol hours right before their shift or after their shift because that's important. Uh, just as we talked about, these officers need to know the neighborhood. They need to know the community. So in order for I mean, and right now we're just doing it, um, you know, uh, as you know, supplementing uh, or having these officers uh, sign up for that. So those being permanent, um, I think uh, the number that I gave, which was four per uh, per division, uh, is is my goal, because uh, you know we know that they're they're using um, these resources, um, you know, one or two days a week. Now, if we have, as you know, uh, the shift or the week is four days, right? So having uh, four days, uh, however that that will work out on one side or, or what days, I think will be more consistent. They'll be there for uh, for ten hours, um, as opposed to four or five hours. So I, I think we can do more uh, with that with just with just those four officers. Uh, again, we can start with two uh, and then build up to four. But uh, that's that's my uh, my vision for that. And, and realistically, how quickly do you think you know if, if you had um, the resources, say if in the next budget, right, we were able to allocate resources. How many bodies do you think you would need to add to your overall um, full-time equivalencies, you know, and, and then ultimately staff up to, to get there? Um, are you just talking about um, foot patrols? Or are you talking about for, <laughs> for everything else that we need? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I am I'm in consideration of everything else you would need, right? So, I mean, clearly, if you were able to get 
you know, 10 new bodies, overall full-time equivalent officers in this next budget, that's not going to be enough, right, to, to then say, oh, we're going to direct it all to these, these walking beats, um, right? You have other holes that you need to fill. So right. that's what I'm curious about is, is do you have an idea on, on where really the numbers need to be, your overall staffing numbers, before you can actually implement something like these four, you know, walking beat officers um, per district? Or sure. Um, and again, it goes back down to priorities. I know we're um, looking at uh, different things right now with reimagining, as has just been mentioned. So my priority for filling uh, new officers or positions as we get them is one to staff MCAT. Uh, MCAT, uh, we know, has been working uh, right now. Those officers are working on overtime. We're pulling officers from other uh, divisions and beats to fill those, uh, not only because this is a pilot program. So uh, the MCAT uh, would be something that needs to be filled um, immediately. Um, and I think everyone on, on this call here would, would, would agree uh, that uh, it has been a, a tremendous resource to us in, in helping our community out um, given the number of calls that we have. So we have those numbers. I think uh, we're looking at, um, I believe uh, it was eight. Uh, eventually, uh, you know, as, as we grow, then we, we can add more to the uh, mobile crisis assessment team, which is MCAT. And then uh, the, uh, the foot patrols. I, I think that will be uh, our next because we, we know that we have not only as part of community policing, uh, but we know that uh, these officers that you've seen address not only uh, violent crime, serious crime, but quality of life issues as well. Uh, which is something that is needed uh, in our neighborhoods. And then from there, obviously, we have uh, st still vacancies in um, our detective bureau, uh, our burglary uh, unit, uh, and then other um, units there as well. And then, again, uh, that's, this is something that we're working on, um, uh, the assistant chief and I, in terms of our staffing plan, and that's something we'll be uh, presenting here once we get all the uh, input from um, all the bureaus, uh, and once we pull all that together. Okay. Yeah, I look forward to that. I mean, I think, a, you know, a staffing up plan um, is going to be key. And, and where I think it'll help too, not only with, with us as, as council members, but with our community to be able to see um, what more we could do with more resources, right? And where those actual bodies would go, uh, what that would translate to. And, uh, and again, I really appreciate the the uh, reports from the captains today that could speak to the benefit of uh, foot patrol, walking beats, having officers out there engaging with the community in that manner, um, and and really the benefits that that brings. And so, uh, I, again, I, I think this is uh, the presentation today is, is very helpful and will be very helpful to continue to advocate uh, that this is the you know included in a more permanent basis versus the overtime that it is now. All right, um, that's it for the comments and questions. So uh, if we can get a roll call vote, please. Arenas? Yes. Jones? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jimenez? Aye. Perales? Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you. Now we'll go on to item uh, D2, which is our strategies to combat hate crimes and violence against Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, uh, our status report. There we go. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sulma Maciel, Director of the Office of Racial Equity, and I am joined by Chris Cambisis, the Immigrant Affairs Manager, as well as Lieutenant Jorge Gutierrez from San Jose PD. Uh, we are here to present the six-month status report on the strategies to combat uh, hate crimes and violence against Asian American Pacific Islanders. So we have a few slides for you, uh, and it's basically going to be in, in this format. Um, I'm going to provide a little bit of background just to refresh your memory on how we got to this point. And we'll also um, hand it over to Chris Cambesis to talk about the implementation of the categories, some highlights, and then we'll talk about next steps and hand it over to Lieutenant Gutierrez for the San Jose PD update. So in just a little bit of background, we know that the Asian Pacific Islander community has been the target of hate crimes and violence long before the COVID-19 pandemic, but the pandemic has further fueled 
an increase in harassment, racism, and violence. And as a result, earlier this year, Councilmember Perales requested that the city administration convene listening sessions and hear directly from AAPI residents about ways in which the city could support and protect the Asian Pacific Islander community. So as a result, um, we took a, a set of recommendations based on the, the community insights to the mayor and the city council. The council accepted staff's report on the strategies to combat hate crimes and violence against Asian American Pacific Islanders. That was in May. Uh, we then, the strategies as we looked at them, um, the Office of Racial Equity and the San Jose Police Department folded those that, that work and those sets of strategies into our work plan. Uh, there were originally 11 strategies and then there were um, some additional ones, for example, for a resolution formally apologizing for the past destruction of Chinatowns. So this six month report um, is essentially that update on what we've done in the last few months. Um, but before I hand it over to Chris, who's going to provide uh, really much more of the, of the update on the implementation of these strategies, I, I really feel like I need to extend my gratitude to the numerous organizations who have partnered with the Office of Racial Equity and the Police Department to implement the strategies. And so I'd like to take an opportunity to thank the Chinese Historical and Cultural Project, UI Kai, San Jose Buddhist Church, Bitsuan, Korean American Community Services, Society of Hearts Delight, Blanca Alvarado Community Resource Center, Vietnamese American Professional Women's Group, Vietnamese American Roundtable, Stop AAPI Hate, Tech for AAPI, the Sikh Gurdwara of San Jose, and many more. Um, and also want to thank Chris Cambisi, Jasmine, and Sabrina, the Immigrant Affairs Team out of the Office of Racial Equity for taking such a collaborative approach and being able to do so much in a short six months. So with that, over to you, Chris. Thank you, Suma. Good afternoon, Chair and uh, committee members. I will now walk you through the implementation categories for the uh, 15 uh, um, uh, strategies that were the form part of this group of strategies to combat uh, hate crimes and violence against uh, Asian Pacific Islander communities. Uh, and then I'll also walk through some of the uh, particular achievements uh, and activities that uh, we have done over the last six months. Uh, so in order to effectively organize uh, our work, uh, categorize and assess um, you know, the priorities for implementation uh, for each of these priorities, because there, there, there are 15 different strategies, each of them interconnected uh, and relating to addressing hate crimes, but in many ways very much distinct uh, from one another, we determined that all 15 fell, broadly speaking, into these three different categories, immediate response and preparedness, engagement and consultation, and communications and, and data. Uh, it's important to note that while all of the 15 strategies fall at least fall within at least one of these three categories, some items fall within two or more. Uh, and that these distinctions are not so much meant to denote sort of a linear progression of implementation in, insofar as we do X and then we do Y and then we do Z, but to reflect the scale of certain ide of identified strategies uh, and the range of activities that are required over time to successfully achieve implementation of these strategies. And as Sulva mentioned, we've done this in conjunction with the activities of the San Jose Police Department um, throughout the entire process. So our work uh, over the last six months has largely been focused on the first two of these categories. So immediate response and preparedness and engagement and consultation. We recognize that given the urgency of the situation, the uh, continued rise and escalation in incidents of hate that are directed at Asian and Pacific Islander communities, uh, and particularly the, the most vulnerable, we needed to prioritize advancing strategies that would provide that immediate support and assistance to community residents, whether that is in terms of material support and assistance or training tools and resources. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. Uh, so one example uh, of this work that falls within the immediate response and preparedness uh, was our allocation of $8,000 to develop and purchase a San Jose specific version of the House Report of Hate Crime uh, Handbook. Uh, this was an initiative that began out in Los Angeles towards the beginning, uh, towards March of uh, 
of, well, the end of 2020 into early 2021. Uh, and it was identified by the community as a tool that uh, had been of assistance to communities both in Los Angeles and then increasingly across the country, and that there was a need for that document here in San Jose, and specifically a version of the document that was specific to San Jose, uh, and in, in broadly speaking, the Bay Area as well. Um, so we were able to collaborate with the, uh, with the writers, the authors, the editors of this document to collect resources and tools uh, that were compiled into these handbooks. And uh, we created a Northern California uh, inclusive of San Jose version of the handbook. From there, we ordered 2000 of the handbooks in five languages, uh, starting with Vietnamese, traditional Chinese, simplified Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. Uh, and to date, we've distributed over 1,000 handbooks to a wider range of community centers, senior organizations, and school, schools and businesses throughout the entire city. Now, we intend to distribute the rest of these handbooks over the next uh, couple of uh, weeks in once the new year begins. Uh, and we are already receiving significant interest from other community groups who are interested in distributing the handbooks in different contexts and in additional languages as well. Uh, so, for example, uh, Tagalog is very high on the list of languages that have been requested and will form part of the uh, next uh, shipment of these handbooks. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as Suma mentioned, one of the core activities that we actively engaged in uh, was working with community leaders, local historians, and council members of the office to draft and introduce the council resolution uh, that formally apologized to Chinese immigrants and their descendants for the role of the city of San Jose in acts of violence, discrimination, and injustice towards the Chinese community. This was a truly significant moment, both for the city uh, as a whole, but for communities, uh, for Asian communities within the, within the city and within the region as a whole, because at the time, San Jose was the largest city in the entire country to have done to have taken a step like this. Uh, and as both a symbolic moment in terms of the message that it sent into, to, to Chinese and Asian communities in general, in terms of the city's willingness to engage with this dark uh, history, and in terms of the ability to, to set a standard, an expectation for how the city intends to move forward uh, in collaboration and reconciliation with its Asian communities, uh, this resolution had tremendous impact and significant value uh, in, 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 in both a local sense, national sense, and an international sense. As a proud Brit, I uh, was extremely uh, surprised when I woke up uh, one morning to see that coverage of this had actually made the BBC um, and was being discussed by family back home. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and then another example of how we continued to engage around this issue uh, was around United Against Hate Week. Um, United Against Hate Week is a initiative that began uh, regionally uh, as a response by various Bay Area cities uh, to, to band together and recognize and acknowledge and put forward a united front against hate of, of all kinds. Um, so we helped to support and organize the city's participation in United Against Hate Week, including uh, supporting collaborating with Councilmember Arenas' office uh, with, for the uh, council proclamation that was introduced. Um, and we also, in addition to distributing um, some of the handbooks and having some one-on-one uh, -on -one engagement with uh, community organizations on the ground throughout the week. We also hosted a virtual community conversation on hate crimes that was directed at Asian and Pacific Islander communities. Um, we recognize the importance of having, providing a forum for uh, individuals, community leaders of various different uh, backgrounds, uh, Asian and Pacific Islander backgrounds to come together and discuss not just anti-Asian hate, uh, and the ramifications of anti-Asian hate, but the intersectionality of such hate with issues such as anti-LGBTQ discrimination and Islamophobia and other religious-based uh, hate uh, as well. Right. Next slide, please. 
So we recognize that there is a significant amount of work that is still to be done. Um, as I mentioned earlier, most of our work over the last six months has been focused on those two uh, primary, uh, the, those two implementation categories, uh, initial implementation categories to address those immediate needs and to prepare our communities uh, for the ongoing challenges they face and ensure that we can build uh, substantial resiliency. Um, as we move forward into the next six months and over the next year, we have several major priorities and several uh, strategies that we'll, we'll continue to implement. Um, but to highlight a few of those um, as we move forward, uh, it's important to think of these within the context of addressing some of the more systemic issues within the way we approach data and within the way we approach communication. Um, and these take time and they take deliberate effort uh, and they take work that is aligned very, very closely with the work of my team within the Immigrant Affairs team in the Office of Racial Equity and the Office of Racial Equity as a whole. But a few examples of some of the next steps that we are planning on taking. The California Department of Justice uh, recently released a um, new toolkit of hate crime materials that are available in over 20 languages. There's been a tremendous demand uh, for uh, useful information and resources that are linguistically appropriate uh, for an increasingly large number of groups. And the California Department of Justice has stepped forward to make that available to us. We're all, in speaking of linguistic capability, We'll also be supporting an evaluation of the city's communications to ensure that linguistic and cultural competency of communications targeting API communities are factored uh, into everything that we do uh, and are centered in our work. And this aligns very closely with several of the strategies uh, that are outlined um, in the 15. Uh, we will also be uh, supporting education and awareness campaigns to highlight the cultural diversity contained within the acronym API. Uh, and we're going to put a particular focus as well on South Asian communities who are often excluded from these discussions. For example, the, the Sikh community, um, who, as I mentioned when we were discussing the United Against Hate Week uh, events, often sit at the intersection of many different forms uh, of hate and have unique experiences that need to be factored in to the way we approach this work. Um, and then, as well as uh, incorporated and requested in, into the uh, strategies as well. We'll be exploring partnerships to conduct a solidarity based, solidarity art based campaign uh, that promotes the concept of stop API hate. Um, and uh, we'll, be exploring, as I we'll be exploring several opportunities with different community organizations to do something similar, um, particularly as we start entering the March and April time period. And we're within a year, uh, we're at the year mark of really the rise of the national sort of understanding of the magnitude of the challenge facing uh, Asian, Asian and Pacific Islander communities, both here in, in San Jose and across the country. So with that, I will turn it over to Lieutenant Gutierrez uh, for the update uh, from the San Jose Police Department. Thank you, Chris. Uh, can you hear me? Thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you, Chair, uh, for the opportunity. Um, my name is Jorge Gutierrez, San Jose Police uh, Lieutenant for the Gang Investigations and the Assaults Unit. I am going to give you an over overview and provide you with the status report on the implementation of strategies our department has taken to combat hate crimes and violence against Asian and Pacific Islanders. Next. Uh, hate crime definition, uh, any unlawful action against the person or property of another committed because of the victim's actual or perceived race, color, religion, ancestry, national origin, disability, gender, or sexual orientation, whether or not performed under the color of authority. authority. The uh, hate motivated incident is a non-criminal act, including words directed at a person motivated by the same bias as a hate crime. Next. So you have a crime motivated by, or, or motiv motivation for committing the crime based on bias, then you have a hate crime. Next. <clears throat> um, now I'm gonna give you an over, uh, over, 
I'm going to go over hate crime numbers that include national, state, and local statistics. Uh, one thing we keep in mind is that these numbers represent a person whose rights were violated because of who they are. Uh, not only do these crimes and the hate incidents affect them, but it affects the, their family, friends, and the local communities. And as you can see, uh, in uh, this is a period of five years from 2017 to uh, uh, 2021. Uh, 2021 is up to September. Uh, the majority of the hate crimes are race and ethnicity with 70%, uh, 204. Next. Uh, the next, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the next uh, slide is the, um, uh, the crime specific to, um, by race and ethnicity, uh, African Americans continue to be a higher number uh, of uh, 90 in the, in the last five years. Uh, Asian Americans uh, or API have their, in the last, Five years has been 33. Uh, Hispanics to be uh, Hispanic or Latino become a uh, close second to uh, African Americans. Next. Religion. Um, this is uh, again uh, within the past five years, uh, Jewish continue to be um, our most targeted group, uh, coming close to second Islamic uh, folks. Next. Sexual orientation, uh, you're looking at uh, gay males being uh, predominantly targeted uh, in this area. Uh, lesbians coming in uh, close second, mixed group um, coming in at three. Next, please. This is a national uh, statistics. Uh, race, race, ethnicity, and ancestry continue to be the highest targeted group. Uh, of uh, individuals nationally, there were 52, 27 uh, people targeted because of that uh, religion coming in uh, close second. And this is uh, through the FBI Uniform Crime Report uh, for 2020. Next. Next. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the uh, San Jose uh, PD specifically, uh, or internal numbers. We've had a total of 94 uh, in 2020. Uh, 75 of those numbers are race and ethnicity, uh, religion coming in uh, tied with uh, sexual orientation uh, at both nine each. And this is uh, the, the statistics that we report to the uh, uh, Department, of, Department of Justice. Next. Now you're looking at a, uh, a nationwide, uh, large cities uh, in the nation for 2020. As you can see, um, San Jose has uh, the most, uh, the highest number of 94 uh, hate crimes reported uh, for the year 2020. Uh, one of the things that uh, we keep in mind is that uh, the outreach that we've been doing to the community in reporting hate crimes. And uh, I believe that's because uh, we actively report those numbers to DOJ. Next. The way we uh, target or, or the way we, uh, we look at our uh, hate crime uh, in combating hate crime is a three-pronged three approach. One is uh, through duty manual in uh, 2001, uh, our department in 2001 created the hate crime investigations policy mandating documentation and investigations of hate, hate crime. And in 1993, the, uh, the department created the hate crime detail out of the assaults unit. We currently have eight detectives assigned to the uh, assaults unit with two supervisors. Any of those detectives can, uh, I, uh, can, have a, uh, can be assigned a case, but uh, when necessary, um, everybody's able to help to investigate those crimes. Criteria for reporting, uh, we have uh, when, an, when an, an individual reports uh, a crime, uh, officers respond out to take a report. Once the officer determines that, that a crime, a hate crime has been committed, they take the report and uh, also uh, makes 
notification to the assault unit uh, supervisor. If a uh, if a crime is uh, is uh, if a crime uh, warrants the investigation to immediately begin with uh, the bureau of investigations, then we have uh, detectives respond out to the scene and assist with that investigation. Uh, one of the things that we keep in mind is that uh, a lot of these hate crimes are being committed by strangers, um, people that are not known to the victim. Uh, so uh, these incidents are a little bit more complex and requires a lot more investigation than your, than your typical, uh, than, than other crimes. Uh, once uh, the patrol officer takes the uh, report um, and if uh, BUI doesn't respond then it comes to the assault unit and the, the sergeant assigns a detective to work on that case. The second one is uh, through training. Uh, in the academy, uh, recruit, recruit officers are uh, tasked to learn uh, about hate crimes and hate investigations. We also do that through roll call training uh, via patrol, uh, via patrol briefings. Um, from time to time, if there's an update, uh, there's roll call training. They're also done through uh, training bulletin, bulletins uh, put out by uh, research and development. And the most recent training mandate is in response to Council Member Esparza memo early this year. Department members are required to complete a two-hour training of hate crimes identification and investigation training being conducted by uh, post, the post learning center, uh, the learning portal, post learning portal. The type of outreach that we've been doing, uh, we um, conducted a, a webinar um, uh, through with uh, many of the stakeholders um, that included the district attorney's office, uh, included um, several members of the community in educating the public uh, on how to report hate crimes. And that was done um, both in English and Vietnamese. The uh, crime prevention unit has been doing multiple uh, presentations to both uh, the youth, uh, such as uh, uh, challenge, challenges and choices, uh, digital safety bullying and cyberbullying, uh, incorporating uh, the identification and reporting of hate crimes. They've also done, done uh, over uh, 11 presentations dealing with uh, API reporting safety and uh, uh, documentation. Next. Ongoing efforts. Um, last, uh, this year we, uh, our, our unit along with the fiscal unit uh, applied for a uh, DOJ grant and we were granted $750,000 uh, to uh, assist in combating hate crimes. And that grant is going to be uh, used to do outreach, uh, working with uh, the district attorney's office, working with the crime prevention unit in, in reaching more of our community and uh, specifically uh, doing a little bit more of uh, walking beats in those areas, uh, like Captain Schaaf said earlier, um, like the Little Saigon or areas where victims are being targeted more frequently. Uh, part of that money is also uh, to assign additional hours for detectives to work on additional follow-up. Like I mentioned earlier, those uh, investigations are a little bit more complex in, in the fact that uh, the, the suspect in this uh, incident uh, are not known to the survivor or the victim. Um, and it's also going to be used to enhance the collaboration approach with the district attorney's office for a successful prosecution. One of the things that uh, we are going to be doing is um, uh, we're hoping to add an, an analyst to our assault unit that would monitor hate speech. Uh, monitoring hate speech is generally, it's a general practice, in general practice is prohibited, it's problematic for law enforcement as the, the line between hate speech and freedom Afforded, afforded by the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution or often blurred. So that's that's something that we have to keep in mind. And that's general rule law enforcement is prohibited from widespread monitoring of any group 
who exercises their freedom of speech and, and otherwise uh, violating the law. Um, so that's something that we have to look at uh, in terms of uh, when we look at the penal code section of 422, which is criminal threats. One of the things that we've been monitoring would be uh, open source uh, social media hate groups, uh, co coordinating with our department's intelligence unit and crime data intelligence center on specific threats and com uh, compiling statistics and support uh, to support and request uh, stemming from citywide hate crime prevention committees and task forces. Next. Are there any questions? Chair, that concludes the presentation. And we welcome members of the committee and their questions. Thank you, I apologize. Uh... I had to run off to the restroom. I asked uh, Vice Chair Jimenez uh, to, to step in, but he's, he's apparently leaving me hanging here. So um, we'll go to a public comment first. I'll, I'll be back in a second. Paul Soto. I would like to comment when uh, Perales is back. P Perales needs to hear this. So I would like to put off my comment until he's present. Thank you. Okay, Blair. Blair. Beekman. Hi, thank you, Blair Beekman. I'll be happy to go first at this time. Uh, there's a slight ringing sound, if that can be helped, if that can be corrected at all. Um, thanks a lot for this item. Uh, you know, thanks for the two past items today. Uh, you've, you've, you've taken a very soft approach in how to talk about volatile subjects. And uh, so thank you for that. Uh, it's, it's helpful for me. Um, we're going through quite a number of issues with uh, Asian issues right now and uh, in San Jose. Good luck how we can uh, make this uh, an open, friendly conversation. It takes work to do that, and we're doing that, and uh, it's nice. It's helpful for myself. I really need it personally, so it's hard work, but we, we can do it together, and this is how we all, all boats can rise, I guess is the idea. And uh, so good luck how we can continue this, this good efforts. Good luck how people can, uh, in, the, in the efforts that, you know, city government and, and community is working on that others can see this sort of effort and want to take heart and, and, and learn from it, <laughs> which is kind of myself. I mean, so, sometimes you feel excluded, but still you try and uh, good luck to how we can try and uh, so thanks for this item. I was a little disappointed to, to read uh, uh, Jewish statistics within San Jose. Uh, those, those numbers were a little surprising to myself. Um, other than that, uh, I guess, uh, thank you for this item. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Soto, did you want to talk right now? I'm back. Only if uh, okay. uh, Councilman uh, Prowse is present. If he's not present, I'll go ahead and speak. I won't hold uh, up. Yes, so looks like he is present, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, Paul Sutton from the Horseshoe. There will never come a time when the rate and the victim of murder, rape, robbery, and theft, there will never come a time when we check the language of the victim impact statement. Now, when in, we're in a court of law, and the victim comes up and is able to directly speak directly to the one that committed the crime. We don't have these, uh, oh, well, you, you, you can only say certain things in a certain way. No, we don't do that to them. So don't you ever, ever expect that from me because I will never hold back what it is that must be said to the beneficiaries of rape, plunder, and theft of my people ever. That's number one. Number two, Councilman Perales, you politicized the apology to the Chinese community. It was not a moral imperative for you, was it? It was not, a, it was not an ethical issue. 
It was political advantage. And you exploited the very office by which I argued in that room for the budget. I was in that room with you on what? I fought for that budget. And the first beneficiary of that office were the Chinese. And you think the Rasta, the Mexicanos, the Chicanos and the natives don't have no, no, we don't have nothing coming from the city. We don't have nothing coming. It's the Asian population. It's the Vietnamese population. Let me tell you something, boy. The Chicano moratorium was because Chicanos were over there fighting in Vietnam to give Vietnam, Vietnamese democracy in the fields of Vietnam while we were denied democracy in the fields of Sassi Puedes. You got your nerve, Perales. You got your nerve, on boy. You ain't even a, man, just, you ain't even a Chicano. You ain't Mexican. You ain't nothing, dude. Nothing. Thanks for those encouraging words. Um, now we'll come back to members of the committee. I don't see any hands up at the moment. All right, I'll jump in briefly here. Um, well, first off, thank you for, uh, for the work, uh, the report here, but more importantly, the work. Um, it has been uh, tremendous to, to be able to see the progress that we can, we can accomplish with both our, our new office of uh, racial equity and, uh, and our police department. And then specifically in, in the focus that we've had on identifying hate crimes um, and then being able to respond to those hate crimes over the last couple of years. Um, I know that we, specifically when I was an officer, uh, there were, um, I think, a lot of crimes that could have been uh, identified as hate crimes, but it was just not as um, <laughs> excuse me, not as specific of a focus for uh, identification. And unfortunately, as we saw over um, in the last number of years, um, hate crimes really uh, uptick. And, um, and I think we responded correctly within the city and within our police department. And um, unfortunately, right, seeing some of those numbers rise, uh, but I think it's a good thing to be able to identify those crimes and, uh, and then be proactive in how we can also um, work more productively with our diverse community uh, that we're proud to have here in uh, San Jose. And um, I don't have any other specific questions. I appreciate the, the report. Um, and I'll ask if my colleagues can make a motion to accept. So moved. No, second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Can we get a roll call vote, please? Arenas? Arenas? Jones? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jimenez? Jimenez? Perales? Yes. Passed. All right, well, at least uh, Councilmember Jimenez didn't just leave me hanging. Um, all right, let's see here. Let's move on. We're now going to item D3, our uh, retirement plans investment annual report. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Jay Kwan from the Office of Retirement Services on behalf of CIO Prabhu Polani and CEO Roberto Pena. Uh, just making sure that you all can hear me. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, we can hear you. Great, thanks. So it seems like a pretty eclectic set of agenda items today, but uh, I'd, I'd like to present the annual pension plan performance results for both the uh, police and fire department retirement plan, as well as the Federated City Employees Retirement System. So I'll try and be brief, but uh, here we go. I'll start with Federated, which as of the most recent quarter end in September, returned 22.8% for the trailing one year period. Uh, if you want to rewind a little bit further back and look at the fiscal year that ended in June, the returns were even higher at 29.2%. Um, the returns for police and fire are similar. So that's 20.4% uh, for the trailing one year period from September. And again, to, to look at the fiscal year that ended in June, the returns were 26.3%. So. Uh, well, I'm, I'm happy to say that these are good returns. The, the percentages don't really convey the scale of the performance. So in dollar terms, 
the pensions added almost $1.7 billion in investment gains during the most recent fiscal year. That's uh, uh, summing across both plans. So uh, a welcome addition, certainly. Uh, just a little bit of context, the gains are a result of financial markets rebounding from the sharp but um, short-lived, thankfully, COVID drawdown. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that the investment program did beat the market in the sense that we beat our policy benchmark. And that's, uh, I chalked that up to the continued diligence and cooperation between staff, board, and consultants, um, all working under the guidance of our CIO. So looking ahead to this year, uh, quickly, performance fiscal year to date is, is, is much more muted. Uh, and you can see that, uh, you can get a hint of that from the quarter to date figures in the September uh, returns. So there's a, a number of potential market catalysts ahead. Uh, you've seen all the headlines. And it, it, as much as I'd love to be here next year reporting similarly standout figures, uh, I think realistically expectations are, are uh, much lower. Uh, the rest of the presentation includes some history around the discount rate for each plan, which has continued to decline as a reflection of lower expectations, so lower returns over time. Uh, there's a, a maybe a decade-long pattern of declining discount rates. Uh, as well, the staff memo that's also attached to the agenda includes further performance history. If you wanted to look at the performance of uh, either plan going back a decade, you could see that in the memo. Uh, as well as there's some detail around the asset allocation, so how the investments are allocated amongst different asset classes uh, for each pension, uh, as well as the, uh, their associated smaller healthcare trusts. Um, I'll, I'll stop here if, if, and take any questions if you have any. Yeah, thank you very much. Is this the end of the presentation or are you just pausing? Oh, that's it. Okay, great. We'll go over to our public commenters first. Well, first up, uh, we have Paul Soto. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I'd like a breakdown of where you have these investments. You said that the, the, the majority is from uh, financial markets, and that's fine. Um, I want to know um, where you're invested in petroleum. I want to know where you're invested in in terms of the uh, cobalt, cobalt mining. I want to know where you're at with the mining because all of this – Electrical technology is going to require batteries for these cars that they want self-automated and the buses. So what that means is, is that cobalt and nickel are the primary ingredients in these electrical batteries. So that means that wars are going to be started in the areas of the, of the world where those mines are at. I want to know where you're invested in. I want to know if you're invested in those mines. I want to know how much you got invested in cobalt. I want to know how much you got invested in nickel. I want to know how much you got invested in petroleum, okay, and the private prison industry. I want to know how much of this money is invested in the private prison industry because I think there's moral and ethical questions that we have to ask ourselves. You know, and, and, and this retirement fund is not exempt from that. In fact, I would demand even more considering it's for cops and the fire department. Secondly, is that I would like for there to be an analysis after that's done of the social and, 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 and political impacts of the investments of the police department. Why? Because 90% of the budget, 90% of the money that comes out, and this is directly from the top, 90% of the budget for the police department and the, for, comes out of pay and, re, and, and retirement uh, allocations. That's where it comes from, 90%. So this is real important to find out where it is that you have your investments. That's all I got. Next speaker is Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for the words of Paul. I mean, he's offered that a few times now and I've had often the same concerns. Uh, we're going to be asking, uh, you know, uh, for battery, uh, mineral purposes in the next, you know, decade or, or so, what are the worker rights issues for, for the mining of, of the nickel and the uh, lithium and the other one that he mentioned? Um, that, that's important concepts in how to build our, our future investment plans. I know that we want to practice good investment plans, and we have ways to be learning how to do that. 
that uh, that are very uh, humanistic and human rights driven. And good luck to those efforts. Good luck in the continuing auditing efforts of how to bring the questions of equity uh, into into our thinking as a city government. Um, to conclude, uh, you know, uh, like what I said at the beginning of the meeting, uh, at the beginning of this year, San Jose uh, Retirement Board, they had some interesting lectures that really tried to address the future of inflation and wanted to address it formally within this year and next year. Uh, we're getting out of the situation a bit now. I think we can see the light. And I, I think that is from the efforts from people who at the beginning of this year offered good lectures about how to avoid the inflation patterns that we're currently in. So good luck to our efforts. Just a reminder of uh, good practices that happen in San Jose all the time. And just to make light of that and note of it, uh, it's important to do. And uh, so it's what's uh, nice about public comment time. And thanks uh, that you, you can allow me uh, the time and you have the patience uh, for myself of public com comment time. So uh, thank you. All right, thank you. Bringing it back to members of the committee. Any uh, questions, comments? Uh, Council Member Mayhan. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I just want to say thanks for the report and congrats on a good year. And uh, the warning about the year ahead is is noted, but uh, worth celebrating a really positive return this year. So thanks for the, the update and, and the great work. Congratulations. And I'll, sorry, and I'll move acceptance of the uh, report. Second. Thank you. I'll echo those comments from Councilmember Mayhan. Um, certainly good results this year. All right, no other questions or comments. Uh, if we can get a roll call vote, please. Arenas? Yes. Jones? Aye. Mayhan? Aye. Jimenez? Aye. Perales? Yes. All right, that motion passes. Uh, before we go to open forum, um, I wasn't the only one apparently that, that had to step aside for a second, uh, bio break wise, but um, uh, Councilman Renanas had some questions on the last item. Um, and I don't know if we have anybody still here to answer questions and then we can decide if we need to take a, a vote up on it again. But uh, for item D2, um, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, oh, I see Chris is here. Uh, so I'll turn over to you, Council Member Arenas, and then we'll see if Chris can answer. W wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, I, I also took a, a bio break and um, didn't plan it accordingly. So I, I missed the vote, but more importantly, I missed this discussion, which um, I was part of that uh, uh, request to bring this back. And I want to thank Council Members Perales for his leadership in, in making sure that we um, bring resolution um, to some of the former hate that, uh, that some of our communities have, have um, endured and then to also uh, prevent and interrupt the current hate that is happening within our communities and across our our cities. Um, I know I, I talked a little bit about how I would love to see us leverage our resources based on um, some of the foot patrol that we just finished speaking about and um, there's a consultant that uh, uh, leave. I just be, I believe that just got hired. Um, if I'm not wrong, for uh, for our, through an RFQ for um, the Tully Business Association that I proposed during the budget. And so, I think it's 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 um, it's it would be great if we could have the ORE. Um, who's dealing with some, uh, the campaign and bringing folks in who are stakeholders, as well as our police department, who is dealing with some of the hate crimes, and um, and then uh, the business association um, that is there and feeling maybe some of the brunt of of some of those crimes to somehow coordinate together. And, you know, I, we, we can also take this conversation because I think it'll be a longer conversation and also because our police department isn't present, but I'd love to see how we could leverage this and not have parallel um, resources expended on the same community. Maybe this is for Lee. 
Yeah, Chris, I didn't know if you wanted to jump in first or Zulma before I respond. You know, I would add that, uh, you know, the intent is to continue the coordination with San Jose Police Department. And, um, you know, from my view, council member, I don't know that there's any duplication of services. It's really just sort of enhancing what one another's doing and really trying to understand um, what the communities need and how we best get the message out there. And I think that that's one of the roles that the Office of Racial Equity has and ensure access to information and resources in ways that are culturally uh, relevant and linguistically appropriate. And so I think that, you know, we look forward to the continued collaboration with San Jose PD. Yeah, no, there, I, I didn't think there's any duplication of services. I sure as heck do not want you uh, doing any of the stuff our police department <laughs> gets uh, trained and paid to do out in the streets. Um, what I was hoping is for some coordination, right? So there's the foot patrol that is getting approved. And I believe that there is an additional, um, uh, I think 750,000 um, award from the Bureau of Justice. It's a three year grant. Um, and so one of the things, uh, there's certain areas that are focused that council member Perales, myself and I believe council member as far as a um pointed out in our in our um memos from um may 21st um outlining some some of these high need areas and so i think that some of those high need areas should be um in that member i want that memo to be considered as part of uh, the decision making and so some of those high need areas but aside from that I also would like for us to leverage our efforts. And so if some of our businesses are going through and are experiencing crimes against them and against their patrons, and we're having this campaign also to um, interfere or intervene with and, and promote really not, not this, I, I have a, a bit of an issue on the state, stop the hate. Instead, I'd love to see the end result of that and, you know, start the love or, you know, something that includes the end result and the objective that what we really want or um, uh, the sense of brotherhood with our, our Asian community. Um, that all in itself is another discussion, but I'm wondering how can we coordinate these efforts that we know are going are taking place, and so I want them to have some level of coordination rather than um, have them uh, be done separately. Yeah, so I'll I'll jump in there, and I and I think um, obviously today's report is um, you know I, I thought PD and, and Office of Racial Equity did a great job. I think after today's report, we need to actually take the the next step, and then you heard me say uh, this again and again during 3.1 reports, so you're, you're probably sick of me by now. Um, but if we're doing a bunch of things in silo or in parallel and not actually aligning, it actually is a disservice to the community, right? We're asking them to follow all of our different tracks. And so kind of the, the work for us here, whether it's in Zulma's shop, um, you know, deputy chief and PD who, who was able to come back, thank you, Hel, for, for being here again. Oh, um, or even as we're out in the community, you know, as you know, council member with, with parks or office of economic development is to tie some of these things together. So when that individual or that business is hearing from the city, it's, it's kind of one voice. It's not just mm -hmm. department X or department Y or Z. And, and so that's a step that we need to take, um, and, and trust that Zulma, Chris and, and Al are trying to get there, um, and pull in others as a, as needed basis, um, because I do think you are absolutely correct. That's where we need to be. And I think that's where our community expects us to be. Okay, so we'll, uh, ho hopefully what we could do is have a separate um, meeting um, just exclusively for that. And we can pull in uh, council member um, Esparza since we share uh, boundaries. And then we'll ask her to pitch in some funding uh, from district seven. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, to leverage the resources, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on. Sounds, sounds like a motion on the funding. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, I love it. Uh, the other question I had was I, I wanted to um, peel the onion a, a bit um, on some of the numbers. I know that we have a really large Asian population and 
and and sometimes it's unfair to say Asian population because um, you know there's so many subgroups uh, under that, and each um, as Chris you pointed out, you know the Sikh community um, kind of bears the brunt of some of the anti-Muslim um, hate crimes because they're the most apparent, right? And people don't who, they don't know first of all who a Muslim is and the only identification really sometimes is that turban and that is not accurate. Um, and so uh, in my district, we have a, a large uh, South Asian and Vietnamese and um, Filipino. And so I'm wondering if you have a bit of a breakdown on that data. When we say, you know, the, the, the and Chris, you had a, um, a graph that had the number of, of uh, incidents, I think for the last five years, correct? That represented five years. Actually, yes. Yeah, so, uh, Lieutenant Gutierrez had that as part. Oh, of that course. was. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. I, I know it was a male voice. <laughs> it was in Sumba, <laughs> I didn't have Sumba. Um So I apologize. But whoever had that, it would be great to have a breakdown of what that meant, because based on who that group, you know, that is um, getting targeted the most, then the those strategies need to be personalized to that culture and the way that we connect with them and even communicate with with um, those cultures um, that are being targeted. Um, I think in the past I've heard, um, you know what, I'm not going to even include my anecdotal, but I know from our past um, administration, from our former um, uh, city, uh, the city manager, um, there was there was a, a group that we were thinking. Um, and so I, I just want to make sure that the strategies that, that are being implemented represent and follow the data. And I just want to be able to follow that a little bit more and that if there's relationships that we need to help bridge or um, and that each one of us as, as council members can help with, that that also happens. Um, because we get to hear a lot of the stuff that doesn't get reported. And I'll tell you for uh, my district, um, for the almost from the beginning of my term, and unfortunately that's the beginning of the Trump term as well, um, there is a lot of um, South Asians who, who, were, who were being targeted um, and you know some of the women who are running, just jogging, and, and you know, doing taking some part in their daily routine, they just wouldn't report it, and I would try to encourage them to do that. Um, and so I know it's not really cap. I I know it's completely underreported, but but I really liked for us to delve into those that data. Is that something that we could do? I see. Uh, is that Lieutenant Gutierrez? Was that something that w could be possible? Or DC Washburn. Yeah, I mean, I could jump in there. I was sure. I was going to see if uh, Lieutenant Gutierrez could probably expand on it. He's more intimate with the knowledge. And and first and foremost, like I appreciate the fact that we want our response to be data driven, right? Certainly that that is part of it. Um, and at the same time, <laughs> just looking at the reports provided by Crime Analysis, I know the categorization or the bias type that we look at as a law enforcement organization and then report to DOJ on is a category called, you know, Asian, which, as we know, is inclusive of, you know, uh, more than one ethnicity, if you will. And I think that's one of the challenges with race as a social construct, right? It seems like a, a widespread group of persons and communities are kind of pushed into one label or category, which I think there's, it's flawed in and of itself as a construct. All that aside, that is what we're working with and dealing with. And what I was gonna say is, and if Lieutenant Gutierrez is not on the line or doesn't know, um, I'd have to look into because I'm not sure that that's how we track it. I know when we officers fill out reports and we have what we call entities, and there's you know there's pre-set reports and boxes that they check, um, and it may you know I don't know how far it drills down into mm -hmm. defining what Asian is. Right. And um, let me see if Lieutenant Gutierrez, yes, he's back on the line. Hori, can you maybe shed some light on how far we are able to drill down presently with the information we have as it relates to subcategories within uh, the bias of Asian or the Asian categories? Yeah, um, that, that uh, category itself uh, covers uh, 
a significant amount of uh, folks. So uh, I think uh, if we want specific numbers, uh, we can we can get them through crime analysis. And um, but I, I think that has to do with, like you said earlier, uh, the way that entities are uh, entered into the system. Okay, thanks. You know, and the last thing I'll say, Councilmember Arenas, is you know we always say how it's important for us to meet people where they're at, and you know, despite maybe not having the subset of numbers to define those uh, those communities within Asia, Asia, right, or Asian uh, ethnicity on our reports, I think the response should be inclusive. And I and I know that's what the Office of Racial Equity is doing. You know, insofar as they highlighted our city's response to the Sikh community. Um, and I think it's a matter of the community engagement, the outreach, and, and responding to all communities because we know there likely is under right. Um, right. So while we want to be intelligent and thoughtful and respond with data as a touch point, right? Mm -hmm. Certainly, there's a human element to this, and and you know I have the confidence that that's what we're doing as a response, you know, as a city. Um, but you know I I can continue this conversation with you offline and look a little bit deeper into that and just have a conversation with crime yep. analysis. You know, I have some curiosities myself about how far we can drill down presently yeah. with the knowledge that we have and I can report back to you on that. Yeah, I th thank you for bringing that up. And, and that is that, you know, former campaign of, you know, this melting pot um, idea that we're all melting together. Um, although I feel like I'm at the bottom of the pot, you know, that this stuff that you scrape off <laughs> is never the good stuff. Um, and, and, you know, and there's an element of like wanting uh, um, folks needing to be American first and foremost, rather than, you know, the, their own um, race. Um, uh, and so I'm, I'm sure that, that, that we also have to be sensitive in the way that we maybe ask or, or, or elicit, not maybe not ask, but just elicit some of that information. So we, you know, the, that people don't feel that we're, um, oh, it's because you are um, and that's why this happened, right? And 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 anyways, uh, I, we'll take this conversation offline. I, I appreciate um, just you know stopping here and, and figuring what that is. I know I know our police department is going to respond, you know, uh, and personalize this to who whom whomever it's happening to. Um, and we know who lives in our community. We know we have a large Vietnamese community. We have a large. Um, um, a South Asian community and Filipino and and Chinese and in some parts of our of our areas, so so I have no you know no reservations about that. But I would like to see how all of this kind of connects and then how our ORE department is also um, aligning some of that with your data and then that human element that you spoke about uh, all that together because I think that's how we have a very effective campaign right and um, to interrupt all of this and so um thank you for for going down this path with me um the the other thing that i was going to ask about um so we'll follow up on the on the Tully king association piece of it offline and then we'll we'll follow up on on this um and then the the last piece, um, Chris, that, that you brought up in one of your slides was that the number of hate crimes that were happening against um, uh, the Black community was astounding. Um, I mean, every hate crime against anybody is just terrible. Sometimes, you know, the, the crime of, of, of opportunity is, you know, you were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. But a hate crime is so, um, it's so you know, it's a focus and concerted effort against a, a, pe a, a group that you really don't know anybody and you're not differentiating. And so it just really struck me um, and I know this is the, our our item here is is focusing on our um, uh, uh, Asian American and Pacific Islanders, and I don't want to take away from that because they deserve the the time and um, the dedication um, to interrupt the the crimes that are happening against them. But I would also like for us to pick back up um, maybe in the next report or offline. What is also ha happening? What are we doing for our Black community? They're the smallest of our population, and then they are suffering 
um, at a higher, immensely higher rate. Um, so knowing and seeing that I can't, I can't ignore it. Um, and then, you know, along with our ORE, o ORE <laughs> department, how are we taking that into consideration? How is that informing the work that you all are doing um, as well um, in, 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 in all, in, in everything that we do, right? Knowing that just in the back of your, your head, even if it is in a formal campaign. Um, so anyways, is there... Uh, I won't ask if there's any, if there isn't a response, we can take this offline, but just wondering if there's anything that as you, Chris, were going through that um, presentation that you've had some thoughts about that. Certainly, thank you, Council Member. Yes, no, when when uh, Lieutenant Gutierrez shared the, that data with me originally, I think that for both Suma and I, that jumped out significantly, right? And I think it, it, it recognizes, it acknowledges the the complicated reality of hate crimes and while yes you know we are here to, to speak to specific strategies as it pertains to the work plan around anti-asian hate crimes there is a much broader uh conversation to be had you know from the perspective of the immigrant affairs team within the office of racial equity and the office of racial equity as a whole as a whole this is something that we take very seriously and we factor into the work that we do as mm -hmm. we call you know addressing anti-blackness is a major component of the welcoming san jose plan um and we've been advancing a, a range of strategies around that as well. Um, you know, we've been doing a lot of work, particularly on the immigrant affairs side with uh, black uh, immigrant communities, Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Latinx communities here in the city of San Jose as well to build those relationships and strengthen them because they're here and they exist and they are part of our community. Um, and we'll continue to do that work uh, in, into the future. Thank you, Chris. And, yes. and I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt that, but I, I certainly don't want to take the the, the focus away from from the the topic. I just was interested in, um, uh, and thank you for that for for your very um, astute response. Um, but uh, I get that you see it. I get that there is something more comprehensive. And thank you so much for for your leadership on that. Um, obviously, there's already an answer to it. Um, we can talk um, offline as well on this, but um, but thank you so much for for the information on this particular report. I think we'll see this in a year, um, right? Okay. And in the meantime, it, it would be wonderful. Um, I don't know what you um, think of this chair, but would it be um, something that you would like to see in terms of like maybe just a infor uh, information memo to come in maybe half year and see what what's going on yeah i think we could request that we i don't know if we can actually add that to the motion we've lost two of our committee members at this point so i don't know if we could recall the the vote um since you weren't present for it we would need, i think i don't know i could ask our city attorney but i don't know if we need a, a motion on that anyways yeah, uh, I, I think if the administration commits to it we, yeah, we don't yeah. need a motion and we're we're happy to do that okay great will Thanks. the administration commit to this yes all right. <laughs> I just wanted to do a dramatic end. Thank you, <laughs> Lee. Because All right. Well, Anna, did you want to register your vote while you can on this yes, item? Yes, please. My, it's a yes. Okay. Thanks. And Thank we won't you. recall it. We'll just we'll just register that uh, vote as a yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you to the staff for for coming back on that. Um, appreciate that. Thank you. That'll now take us to uh, open forum. Um, we have three speakers. First up will be Paul Soto. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. My in comments were incomplete because I didn't have to consider uh, Councilwoman Arenas' uh, uh, input. So I would like one additional minute to respond to what it is that she just said, because my public comment was deprived. It was incomplete. So that's what I'm requesting. Well, your public comment would have been before Councilwoman Arenas spoke. Uh, so you, No, you, Councilwoman you, Arenas did not speak. Here. She, I, I, I wasn't able to take that into consideration at the time that I spoke on that item. And you wouldn't have been, Paul, because you would have spoken first and she would have spoken after. I'm not gonna debate this with you. You either have a minute and 20 seconds left for public comment and that's it. No, I'll have more than that, but for right now, I'll just have this. That's cool. Um, you can forget about mayor. That's for one thing. You can forget about that because Rebecca Armandadas is warning about those bullets that were fired at me. They're on your phone. So you were warned and as a result of that, that little boy was murdered. Had you acted on what it is that I warned you about, then something would have been done and that boy would still be alive. 
but because you didn't act, that boy's dead. So you carry that. You carry that weight. I'm tired of carrying it. Secondly, what Council One Arenas just said disgust me. It's disgusting. Blacks are on more part. Look at those numbers. Because this city has never cared about Negros. It's never cared about Mexicans. The ultimate of crimes, the ultimate of crimes was the redlining map of 1939. That was the ultimate of hate crimes. And this city does not have the moral or ethical compass because all it concerns about, all it concerns itself about is what is legal. So you go ahead and continue campaigning and continue uh, spending your money, look, uh, uh, Perales, but you or Cindy Chavez ain't going to get anywhere near that mayor's seat because she was warned about Rebecca 30 days before that boy was killed. All right, next uh, we'll be calling user one. Merry Christmas, everybody, since you guys get paid for Christmas, but never wish the public a Merry Christmas. It's always this uh, happy holidays or whatever you're celebrating. That's weak, man. You guys honor every holiday but Christmas. Since you can't honor Christmas, I hope all of you are at your desk on Christmas morning, just like, uh, you know, without pay, all right, without pay. But uh, when it comes to crime and all these things, you need overnight patrols. You need more cops on the beat, but you're not. These cops are basically millionaires with their pensions and their full full benefits for the rest of their lives. They're not going to – they don't care. They show up to a crime. You know, they got their hands in their pockets playing pocket pool as they glance down at their watch. They can care less about the people, about the crimes. You guys are going to hair split all these different groups of people. It's, it's, it's equal opportunity crime here. Everyone's committing crimes against people. It's unbelievable. I mean, the Asians are for surely getting targeted. It's terrible. But you guys don't do anything about it. You guys talk a big game and, and you know talk, talk like you're going to do something. You're not. And Paul Soto's right about Perales and Chavez. You guys need to go, man. I mean, it's time for you guys to retire. Uh, Chavez for sure She's horrible So are you Perales I, I told you City council member Policeman And teacher Three strikes You're out for me buddy You know Mr. Rub your hands together For the pot tax I'll never forget that As long as I live Look like a cartoon When we used to be able To go to these City council meetings Without COVID uh, restrictions But yeah Merry Christmas everybody And hey Think of me When you get paid for it As you go Happy holidays Or whatever you celebrate That is the I, I cannot. Have you guys lit up the city, the, uh, the rotunda at City Hall in Christmas colors? You know, have you guys done that yet? It's Merry Christmas, Mr. Sunsini. Uh, last speaker will be Blair Beekman. All right. Happy end of the year to everyone. Uh, hopefully, PG&E's uh, the CPUC heard PG&E's items at their agenda today. Hopefully, it's going down to defeat their solar plans. Uh, they're not, they're weird. They're not too good. Just to comment on that. Um, thank you for Councilperson Arenas's words about uh, the African American community and uh, hate crime issues. A uh, really important point she made. Thank you for that. Um, I think for uh, I think I'll just say for myself right now. You know, I'm going to try to make a big point in 2022 to not focus on the uh, you know my earthquake stuff of 2023. Hopefully. You know, 2023 may actually be a year that reimagine and equity and, and green sustainability, all our good stuff comes together. And I could be get offering, I'm getting bad signals basically. So, you know, I'm gonna learn to be positive and uh, no planning ideas and natural disaster planning ideas, but I'll try to be po more positive. Um, uh, you know, with that said about equity and, and reimagine, um, I wish I said today, uh, I hope with upcoming policing issues, it's accountability that we can uh, maybe have a focus on at this time as we're kind of like trying to draw together, you know, new ideas. Uh, let's make it an accountable process and all the practices we'll be doing. Share information, share openly what different things are happening. Uh, and that's how you develop good practices. And it gives everybody a positive message what we are building now and what we need to address about the law enforcement issues. Um, finally, uh, about the redistricting questions, um, 
I, thank you for the efforts of uh, Carrasco and Arenas and, and Esparza. They actually offer the idea they do want to work towards a certain equality within, e within each districts. Uh, I thought Councilperson Cohen's maps were good at giving e each district's kind of a, a certain identity. We're going for equality. Do we do continue those efforts? Thanks. All right. Thank you. Uh, our meeting is adjourned.